Uh, let me introduce, uh, first of all, Dr. Rainbow. Some of you know him, uh, no doubt have taken some classes of his over at the college. Uh, he's a biology professor there at Antelope Valley College, holds a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and molecular biology from uh, UC Santa Barbara, master's degree in education from Claremont Graduate School, PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry from uh, UC Irvine. And uh, uh, he, he uh, was a former creationist. He believed in the biblical account of creation and uh, through his study over a period of time came to believe that that was not consistent with uh, uh, the way things are and has since become a, a proponent of evolution and uh, has certainly taught uh, this and uh, I'm not sure if he's ever debated bo before in this kind of a form but certainly on, on more of an individual basis. But, uh, but he is a friend of mine. We've gone to lunch several times and uh, I, I enjoy him as a person. Certainly don't uh, agree with some of his views but I, I respect him as a man and uh, have uh, many interesting conversations over lunch. So I'd like for you to welcome uh, Dr. Rainbow this evening. Dr. Kent Hoven taught uh, high school science for about 15 years and, uh, and then went on to, uh, to get involved in, in this ministry that he's involved in now of teaching uh, uh, creation science, uh, not only in places like this, he's debated many, many times, has written all kinds of material tapes, videos, and all these things, and uh, also got a PhD uh, in education. And uh, he speaks about 700 times a year in forums like this and he'll, he'll speak anywhere, anytime. If he's there, he loves to keep busy and I, I, we've enjoyed him here at this church this weekend and uh, I would like for you to welcome uh, Dr. Hoven from Pensacola, Florida. If you will. Okay, the clock is beginning. We'll first turn it over to uh, Dr. Rainbow, and uh, thank you for coming. Good evening. I'm going to begin by thanking my friend, Pastor Dave Prather, and the members of Central Christian for inviting me here tonight to your beautiful church. Although I am not a Christian or a regular churchgoer, I do attend church occasionally at various places in Lancaster with my sons. And have found that I enjoy coming here to Central Christian perhaps more than anywhere else on Sunday mornings. I have met many wonderful people here and have felt very welcome. It's a great honor and a pleasure for me to have been invited to address tonight's important topic. And I feel especially honored to share a podium with Dr. Kent Hoven, who is an eminent and well-known expert in the field of scientific creationism and who I have had the great pleasure of getting to know in preparations for tonight's debate. This guy totally stole my kids' hearts teaching them how to make paper airplanes and shoot rubber bands. <laughs> I'm going to have trouble competing with him as a father figure from now on. <clears throat> okay, now if we can go ahead and get my, uh, there we go. My, talk tonight is called What Scientific Evidence Is There for Evolution? Then with a special emphasis on how to be a Christian and think properly about the theory of evolution. <clears throat> okay, here's a fascinating and ironic fact about the United States of America. The United States is the most technologically and scientifically advanced nation on the planet the envy of the rest of the world for our research and development infrastructure as well as our university education system, yet in the U.S. approximately half the population reject out of hand the most important scientific principle in all of biology, which is the theory of evolution. Now let's begin by asking what's at stake in the creation evolution controversy? Uh, let's ask, why do evolutionists fight so hard to defend the theory? First, evolution is the central unifying principle of modern biology. Theodosius Dobzhansky, one of the three most famous evolutionists of the 20th century, and a Christian, I might add, a Russian Orthodox Christian, said nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and I would heartily agree with that. 
Two, evolution is an aesthetically beautiful theory with grand and awesome themes. Some evolutionists, including myself, believe that evolution profoundly glorifies God. Some evolutionists use the theory to support an atheistic natural philosophy and argue against the very existence of God, which they have a right to do, just as Christians have a right to argue for the existence of God. Okay, why do creationists abhor the theory of evolution? It seems to make no scientific sense whatsoever. It's a calculated attempt to destroy belief in God and to render the concept of a creator obsolete. It contradicts the book of Genesis and therefore stands in mortal opposition to scripture. It teaches that humans are descended from animals and therefore destroys all basis for morality. And it glorifies death. Now, I have, <clears throat> I've been asked to present the scientific evidence for evolution to an audience which, though personally friendly, is to a large degree intellectually hostile to the subject in a mere 40 minutes. This is a daunting task. In tonight's debate, I, I bear the burden of proof. I must show that there is compelling evidence for the theory of evolution. I think I do a pretty good job of that every semester in my biology classes at AV College, but there I have almost 50 hours to lay the necessary background and explain the theory. My having agreed to do it tonight in a mere 40 minutes uh, to a conceptually hostile audience borders on lunacy. <laughs> I hope you realize how difficult a task I face. I have to try to explain one of, one of the most counterintuitive ideas ever encountered by humans. The idea that physical systems of staggering complexity and design can arise spontaneously through the mere operation of the normal laws of physics and chemistry in only 40 minutes. Pray for me. <laughs> now since I have only 40 minutes in the formal presentation, I cannot talk about everything and I cannot talk to everybody. So I have decided to talk pretty much to just one group of people, the creationists. I'm going to place myself in their frame of reference and assume that a creator of some sort does exist, which I personally suspect is true but am not sure about. I am technically an agnostic, which means I do not know if God exists. But tonight, with your permission, I will talk pretty much as if I were a full-fledged theist since I am trying to operate tonight from within the Christian frame of reference, which I respect. So remember, I am not a Christian, but I used to be a Christian, and it is not impossible that I might become a Christian again someday. I do not want anyone to think that I'm trying to be deceptive or trying to pull the wool over people's eyes, or still worse, that I'm some sort of spirit of darkness masquerading as an angel of light. So in my talk, I will be explicitly speaking to the Christians in the audience who are creationists. All the rest of you. The evolutionists of various persuasions, the atheists, the agnostics, you're formally invited to eaves eavesdrop in on this conversation that I will be having with the creationists. Now, some creationists take considerable offense at the suggestion, uh, by the way, we could go ahead, can we turn on the slides, please? Oh, okay. That's, what do I hit again? Oh, the top. Okay. <clears throat> so some creationists take, by the way, I'm going to read from a prepared text because I have an extremely complex talk tonight with a lot of animations and slides and if I, if I get out of sync with my technology, I'm cooked, so bear with me here. So for the third time, sorry, some creationists take offense at the suggestion that humans have evolved from ape-like ancestors. Allow me now to make a rather aggressive point about that, a point which will also lead naturally into some of the necessary molecular biology that we must talk about tonight. So here's the point. If you're in some sense insulted by the idea that you are descended from animals, then you must really be insulted by Genesis 3.19, which says you are descended from dirt. Genesis says you are descended from Adam, and Adam, whose very name in Hebrew is a pun in the Hebrew on the word for clay, Adam was made from the dust of the ground, which is, let's face it, dirt. In the very earthy account of creation found in Genesis 2 and 3, it says, Then Yahweh formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So in regard to your origins, you have, you have two options. 
You can embrace evolutionary theory, which says that time plus dirt equals humans. Or you can embrace a literal interpretation of Genesis 2, which says that God plus dirt equals humans. In either case, we recognize a fact common to creationism and evolutionism, which is that we are dirt. In other words, we all recognize that our bodies and the bodies of all living things, interestingly enough, are made of non-living atoms. I am a biochemist and molecular biologist by training, and I make my living by studying and teaching students about the fact that all living things are made of normal atoms which obey all the laws of physics and chemistry. From a physical point of view, our bodies are marvelous machines. Here, for example, is a, is a computer-generated image of the atoms in a protein molecule. And then here is a similar image of the atoms in the DNA double helix. By the way, we could turn, I wouldn't mind having the lights down just a little more, Ryan. In fact, fairly dark. I'm a graphical purist here. Can we turn them down a little bit? Oh, okay. Well, can everybody see okay? All right. So it's been proven over and over through tens of thousands of controlled scientific experiments that living things are literally, machi literally machines, uh, constantly obeying all the laws of physics and chemistry. No modern educated person, including creationists, disputes this raw, intriguing fact that from a physical point of view, we are machines. The central question that Dr. Hovind and I are here to address tonight is simply this. How did these machines get here? Now, one of the songs that you sing here in this church, and I have actually sung it with you, putting my own personal spin on the meaning of it, one of the songs you sing has the lyric, Our God is an awesome God. Tonight, I'm going to try to expose you to an idea which, if true, means that God as the creator is even more awesome than you think. Near the end of the 18th century, an English doctor of divinity and professor at Cambridge University, the Reverend William Paley, wrote a seminal work in the history of creationism entitled Evidences of Christianity. In this work, Paley created a memorable image. He said that if you were walking on a heath and hit his phone, foot on a stone, he might inquire how it came to be there, but, but would be able to say little about it. Indeed, the stone might have been laying there forever for all he knew. But, he said, suppose I had found a, a watch upon the ground, and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place. In that case, he argued, we would come to a very different conclusion. Since the watch is made of many intricate parts, which work perfectly together for a single purpose and display a remarkable unified design, he could only conclude that there was a designer responsible for the existence of the watch. Paley went on to explain that in nature, we find countless living creations far more intricate than a watch. For example, the design of the eye with its lens and many other parts is staggering to behold. Everywhere he looked at an oyster, a spoonbill bird, a human kidney, Paley found evidence that nature had a designer. Paley's book was required reading for the young aspiring naturalists and theologians who were in college at Cambridge, and it was particularly inspiring to this student who we will meet again in a moment. This young man was an Orthodox Christian excited about biology and what it taught him about his creator. And he not only read, but even memorized parts of Paley's book. Now, Paley's lesson is really a point about engineering. I'm sure we have many engineers in the audience tonight, since this valley builds the most sophisticated aircraft in the world. Engineers have always taken a great interest in the creation-evolution debate, partly because evolutionary theory tends to come across as complete and utter nonsense to many engineers. Since both special creation and evolution can be considered forms of engineering, one divine and the other natural, I'm now going to make a point about the engineering of living things. Here's a slide of a, actually a fruit fly embryo developing. Now, we all know that whenever something is created by engineers, it always goes through four phases of development. The first phase 
is the conceptual phase, during which actual drawings and blueprints of the machine are made up, which will then guide the upcoming design phase, during which, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I got off here. We had the conceptual phase, the design phase, drawing up blueprints and so forth, uh, which will then guide the upcoming assembly phase, during which the device is painstakingly constructed piece by piece according to the carefully made design. Now after the machine has been constructed, if all has gone well, the engineers now get to power up the machine with its source of energy, turn it on and watch it work. They are now in the phase which engineers live for, namely the operational phase. Now in the creation of a machine, if it has been well conceived, designed and assembled, there will always come a time when the engineer can take his hands off the machine and step back and let the machine run on its own. Think of a computer automatically running programs, rendering graphics, carrying out calculations while its operator sits back in the chair and drinks a soda. Or think of the autopilot on a jetliner which is automatically landing the aircraft in a dense fog as the pilot and co-pilot simply watch the instrument panel with their hands folded. Or think of a robot spot welding parts of a car on an assembly line while no human watches it at all. It's obvious that the most impressive machines of all are machines that run on their own without any further intervention. Such machines are very complex and hard to design and when the engineers who made them finally come to the what I'll call the step back and hands off point, it's an awesome sight to behold. Now living things, as we have said, are complex assemblies of atoms and molecules which obey all the normal laws of physics and chemistry. That is to say they are literally machines. Creationism and evolutionism have different ways of explaining how those machines arose. In fundamentalist Christian creationism, it is believed that God made the first representatives of all the major kinds of living things, quote, out of the ground. That is from earth or clay or dirt or whatever you prefer to call that. That is to say, God made living things piece by piece from normal atoms, including hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, sulfur, manganese, magnesium, zinc, iron, and uh, one more, copper, that green atom right in the middle, that cytochrome C oxidase, a protein you have in your body that's literally carrying electricity in the mitochondria of your cells. It's got a copper atom in the middle, so forth and so on. So other atoms that were present in the earth contributed to this presumably, and God presumably assembled them into fantastic arrays to make DNA double helices and beta pleated sheets and proteins and electron transport chains and mitochondria and so forth, much like Paley's watchmaker might assemble a watch piece, piece by piece from its component springs, gears and levers. It would be an awesome sight to behold. It would have been a, a tremendous thing to see that happen in Genesis 2. But now consider what the theory of evolution asserts. Evolution says that atoms and molecules present in deep space and then on the primitive earth did something radically different from what is described in Genesis 2. Over vast stretches of time, the atoms through a process which is only partially understood, but which I will try to tell you a lot about tonight, did the astonishing thing of self-assembling into living things. I want you to think hard about this. Imagine that you knew a watch designer who was so incredibly skilled at what he did that he could design the parts of a watch, make the parts, throw them out on a table, and then step back and take his hands off watching while the hundreds of parts of the watch put themselves together before your eyes. Would that be unbelievable? Or imagine that one day you're conversing with a friend who works at the Skunk Works where the world's most advanced aircraft have been designed and produced. And he says to you, guess what? We just made a new type of aircraft the world has never seen before and it's just been declassified and I can tell you about it. You say, what is it? A new generation of stealth aircraft? And he says, yes, but that's not what is truly new about it. You say, well, what is so new about it? And he says, it's an aircraft that self-assembles from component parts. 
You, if you know anything at all about engineering, would look at him like he was pulling your leg. And then when you saw he was serious, your jaw would slowly start to drop to the floor because you would know he had gone insane. <laughs> you know that humans cannot yet build truly complex machines that put themselves together. We can make some machines like robot welders on assembly lines that can do simple things in the assembly of other machines, but we cannot even come close to making machines that assemble themselves. But guess who can make machines that assemble themselves? Now do you see why evolutionists get so excited about evolution? Think about this a little more from an engineering point of view again. In normal engineering, where does the step back and hands off point come in the process? Let me get my laser pointer here. There's my wallet, I'm glad I've still got that. <coughs> Okay, where does the step back and hands off point come in the process? The engineers have to have their minds and their hands intimately involved in the conceptual phase, the design phase, and the assembly phase. It is only during the operational phase, assuming everything goes well, that the engineers can step back and hands off. What evolutionary theory allows us to entertain as theists is the idea that Almighty God is creating life on earth, has done something that will set your mind reeling and staggering, something as high above our own engineering abilities as the heavens are high above the earth, something beyond all that we could ask or think. God has pushed the step back and hands off point, which was here, where? He's pushed the step back point into the assembly phase. This is the view of God that theistic evolutionists carry around in their heads. God as the creator is even more awesome than you think. They believe that God, with an intelligence that is nothing less than terrifying, has designed the fundamental particles of the universe and ordained the laws of quantum mechanics so that they will, over time, spontaneously self-assemble into living creatures, while he simply sits back and watches it happen. And then, after 12 billion years of cosmic evolution, when the first humans on the African savanna look up at the night sky and stare at the God which their explosively large cerebral cortex can now sense is there in an attitude of awe and primitive worship, and God stares right back. Let's look at another picture that helps us understand how God chooses to operate if the theory of evolution is correct. Here we have a representation of all that exists in the physical universe, which is called nature, derived from a word which conveys the meaning of being born, and from which we get other words like nativity and natal. Now, in addition to the physical universe, which is detectable with the five senses or with extensions of our five senses, many, and I dare say most, of the people in the world believe that there is another realm of existence that cannot normally be detected with the five senses, which is beyond nature or above nature. The word for above or beyond is super. So this is the super nature all or supernatural realm. And here we see God. Now please don't laugh at my picture of God. But God has chosen to ordain certain <coughs> natural laws which govern the behavior of matter and energy in the physical universe. God seems to really enjoy using natural law. 
since virtually everything obeys God's natural laws virtually all the time. The only time things deviate from natural law is when God is doing the odd miracle here and there, like parting the Red Sea, or changing water to wine, or raising himself from the dead. Here we see just a few examples of famous natural laws expressed as equations, such as, uh, okay, we've got Newton's second law of motion, Einstein's relativity relationship, uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. Here we have Boltzmann's uh, definition of entropy, uh, mass action expression from chemistry, which governs equilibrium in chemical reactions. This uh, one, a partial derivative here is uh, Le Chatelet's principle, principle from chemistry. And then at the bottom, ds is greater than zero is the second law of thermodynamics. Now we could write dozens of major natural laws that have been discovered so far by humans in various fields of the physical and biological sciences. These statements of natural law are the ultimate triumphs and trophies of the scientific endeavor. And I think there's little doubt in this room tonight that God enjoys watching as humans discover his natural laws through scientific endeavor. He has seen to it that humans have powerful, incisive brains which can ask questions, design experiments, and use the scientific method to unravel the secrets of the universe. Every time humans discover a new law or a new principle or a new galaxy or a new fundamental particle, I suspect God is extraordinarily delighted. Over about 150 years of intense research, scientists using the brains that God caused to evolve have by now in the year 2003 developed a fairly extensive explanation of how living things self-assemble through nothing more than the operation of God's natural laws. I'm going to say that again. We now understand, not completely, but pretty well, how living organisms arise through a self-assembly process which is being driven by nothing other than a free-running operation of God's natural laws. I call the process God's automatic creature generating machine. A good teacher will invent flashy names for things, so there it is. How many people here would be willing to, and I don't want to have a, a loud conversation with uh, 2,000 people, but uh, how many people here would be willing to try to learn from a person who has some expertise on the subject how God's creature generating machine works? Can I see a show of hands? Who, who'd be willing to learn something about that? Okay, who would not be willing to learn something about that? Anybody? Oh, okay. <laughs> Someone is closed-minded and admits it. I encourage your, I applaud your can, uh, candidness. Now, some of you may still be reticent to let me in, even for a trial run on evolution. You may be wondering if you will lose your faith if you, if you even so much as entertain evolution. So maybe this will help a little. Can someone be both a Christian and an evolutionist at the same time? Of course they can't. Two of the most famous evolutionists of all time were Christians. Here is George Lemaitre, a Belgian Catholic physicist priest who galvanized cosmologists in 1927 by proposing that the universe began when a hot, dense, primeval atom exploded, an idea which adumbrated the modern Big Bang Theory. He is considered to be the father of the Big Bang Theory. He was later decorated by the Pope for his scientific achievements. And here we have Theodosius Dobzhansky, one of the three greatest evolutionary theorists of the 20th century. He's famous for saying, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And as I pointed out, he was a Russian Orthodox Christian. Okay, now, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do with my remaining time is attempt to explain how two of the most important developments in vertebrate evolution have occurred. I'm going to talk about the evolution of legs and the evolution of wings. And I'm lastly going to uh, talk about what may the, be the most difficult to explain problem in all of organismal evolutional, uh, evolutionary biology, which is the evolution of birds in general. Okay, so here we go now.
What do we mean when we say that living things have evolved? We mean that all living things are genetically related through a process of what Darwin called descent with modification from common ancestors. And here is what I call when I teach it the central mechanism of evolution. All right, here's how evolution works. This is God's automatic creature making machine. Evolution always occurs in three steps. First we have mutation to DNA, which can occur in a multitude of very well understood ways. Secondly, we have altered embryological development. It alters the way the organism develops as an embryo, right here, represented by these arrows. And the third step is always what Charles Darwin discovered, natural selection, where an environmental scenario must exist, which naturally selects for, or at least does not select against, the new phenotype. <coughs> Here's just a few slides showing the guy who uh, figured out the third step. That's the one that we got first going back. Historically, natural selection was figured out first. Uh, Voyage of the Beagle in 1831, Darwin sailed around the world. And then upon his return, got married, had many children, and proceeded in 1859 to publish one of the most famous works in the entire history of science on the origin of species. Okay, the second part of the central mechanism that was discovered was mutation to DNA, discovery of the double helix, uh, principles of genetics in the first part of the century by people like Thomas Hunt, Morgan, and so forth. That was what was worked out next, and it's only extremely recently, it's really only since 1984, that we have even begun to understand the third middle step this is the one that we've never been able to explain until now. And this is why creationists' uh, objections to the theory are entirely reasonable uh, up to this point in time, I would say. So uh, would you like to see the, so here's a picture of an embryo developing. <clears throat> and the third step, altered development, now being unraveled by many, many scientists around the world. Uh, a couple things that you need to understand, one of my goals here is to help explain the theory itself. It's my contention that most creationists reject the theory because they don't really understand the theory. I would reject it too if I understood it the way creationists do. I really would, and I, I don't mean that as an insult. I used to be a creationist. I, I literally applaud you as creationists for not accepting the theory as you understand it. You've done a rational reasonable thing. You've displayed your intelligence by doing that, as has Dr. Hovind, who's an extremely intelligent man, and he's probably going to steamroll over me in the rest of this debate. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but would you like to see the machine itself in operation? Okay. Well, sorry, you can't. <laughs> Because the evolution machine operates continuously and seamlessly all around the planet in every nook and cranny of the Earth's multitudinous environments, and it is also constantly operating genetically on the molecular and biochemical level inside the living cells of all the world's organisms. The machine is way too complicated to see in the true sense of the word. But you know what? I have created a special graphic which provides a simplified, highly schematic picture of the machine in operation. And I call it an evolutionary phase space diagram. Now, let me catch up here. What, what this is going to explain, what this explains is the evolution of legs. We're trying to explain how you go from a lobe fin fish here to an, an, uh, to an early amphibian, a lobe fin fish here, uh, going down, see his little legs there. I really wish it was darker in here. Uh, <clears throat> can we just turn the lights down a little bit? Okay, and we uh, have a pretty good explanation, we think, of how this happened. We think that legs evolved underwater first, not on land. This is a creature called Acanthostega. 
uh, long fish-like tail, totally fish-like body, but he had little tiny legs and toes, eight toes. Uh, here's the actual fossil of Acanthostega. Here's what the skeleton looks like articulated, and we're pretty sure he lived underwater because he had a long fish-like tail that would have done him almost no good on land, crawling around down low to the ground. So now here's my picture of the evolution machine, God's creature-making machine, and how it works. Okay, so here's what's going on in this machine. Now, I know this is really small for most of you, but we'll do the best, I'm doing the best I can. What we have, this is a multivariable graph. That is not a valley, okay? It's, it looks like a valley, it's not a valley. This is a three-dimensional graph in what I call phase space, evolutionary phase space, showing the, uh, how the machine creates organisms automatically. Here on this axis, we have the phenotypic axis. This is what the animals are like. Here we have the environmental axis, going in this case from water to land, deep ocean, coral reef, tide pool, shoreline, dry land. Here we're going from a ray fin fish to a coelacanth to various lobe fin fish, one of which here is Acanthostega, which I just showed you, Ichthyostega, a famous uh, more advanced amphibian, and then finally Tularpeton here, which is a full-fledged land-going amphibian. So we're going again, to give you the big picture, from fins to legs here, and we're going from the deep ocean to the dry land here. Now the vertical axis represents decreasing fitness. Up, so if you're high, you die. If you're low, you go. In other words, you live. If you're high, you die. You're up on what I call the peaks of death. And if you're down low in what I call the valley of survival, that means you are fit. You are well adapted to your environment. Now watch how this works. Let's say you're here in phase space. Can you do the three-dimensional uh, math? Okay, what are you? You're a, you're a ray fin fish. Okay, you're a fish. Where are you? You're on dry land, so you are dead. You're a fish out of water, so you're dead. You are unfit for your environment. Let's do this one. What are you here? Follow it along. You're a full-fledged amphibian, but you're out in the deep blue sea, so you are dead. You are unfit. Let's do this one. What are you here? You're a ray fin fish in the deep ocean. You're beautifully adapted to your environment. And right here, you'd be Tularpeton on dry land, but near a tide pool, so you're doing pretty well here. You're well adapted to your environment. One more here, Acanthostega, that would be right here. You're a primitive amphibian living in a tide pool, trying to make a living uh, in a coral reef. Now, how could he have done that? Let's explain this. Uh, right here, why do we think legs might have evolved underwater? Well, here's the theory. If, if he was out, so mom here takes a mutation in her sperm or egg cells, and that's a critical point to remember. Let's get all this stuff up here. Okay, the mutations to DNA have to take place in sperm or egg cells, otherwise they won't make it into the next generation. Remember always that the new phenotype, the new form of animal, always shows up in junior, always shows up in the offspring, and then natural selection comes into play and has to select, if this is what we're trying to evolve, has to select for this and deselect for the old type of organism. Now in the deep blue sea, do you want to have legs and toes? No, see, he would be poorly adapted. He's dead out there. You want to have fins if you're in the deep blue sea, and that's why we still have fish with us today after 400 million years. If you're living five miles deep in the ocean, in pitch black water that's freezing cold, at pressures that are twice what crush our nuclear submarines, what do you want to be? You don't want to be a human. You better hope to God that you're a fish down there. Okay, but here in a coral reef, see the island and so forth? Here in a coral reef, what we think could have happened is this. If you're in a coral reef, there's powerful currents going back and forth, there's algae and so forth, and one thing that you can try to do is to carry out what we would call ambush predation. 
You remain hidden in the algae or behind rocks and things like that, and then you leap out suddenly with your still fish-like tail and catch fish. Now you can see that if you're still a lobe fin fish right here, he's gonna have a little bit of a hard time carrying out ambush predation because there's powerful currents in a coral reef that are pushing him back and forth, and if he's trying to station keep in some algae, algae, he would have to wave his fins and remain in one place, which is gonna give away his location and scare the prey off. But look what he can do. He can, hang, he can do something that no animal has ever done before in evolution. He can hang on to things with his little legs and toes and remain perfectly motionless and then leap out and catch a fish. This is the theory for how uh, Acanthostega may have been selected for and how legs evolved underwater. Okay, now here's uh, an animation of that process. There's a constant chatter of mutation to DNA that's ceaselessly generating new forms of organisms. The environment is constantly changing here. This is constantly changing. Organisms are constantly migrating or getting blown into new environments. These are the random forces which drive evolution, but what happens next now, see these are random forces. These are random mutations, totally random. Transposons are jumping around in the DNA, moving enhancers around and so forth and so on, creating chaos, most of its birth defects, probably 99.9% .9 of all the mutations are harmful. Uh, this is random events here in the environment, plate tectonics, climate, disease, drought, all kinds of things are taking place here. This is random, this is random, but what goes on now in the machine is anything but random. Evolution is not totally random. So let's, let me now, and here, okay, I'm gonna, press on here and use even some of my time. Okay, now bear with me, I've got to bring up an animation. Okay, we'll try to put this on the whole screen. Okay, and here's what takes place in phase space. Each little dot represents a species or an individual, either one. Organisms explore evolutionary phase space now in single step mutations, and they do it with ruthless efficiency like water exploring a canyon. So what's happening here is that we start off here with a fish in the deep blue sea, mutations take place, and then you go to the next phase here in the valley of survival. And now the numbers, since they're beautifully adapted, they build up. See, they build up in number there. So now you've got more of these guys, uh, you know, lobe fin fish. They build up. And then there are so many of them, there might be 10 million, 100 million lobe fin fish in the, in the Pacific or something like that. And now you can do calculations and show that the probability of the next step, the probability of moving the right enhancer in front of, in front of the right homeotic homeobox gene or whatever, is not only possible, but it's inevitable. You can prove that it's inevitable that the next mutation will take place. 
And so now you get the next, uh, you start to invade the next locus. The little yellow arrows represent mutations. So see, it just keeps building up, next mutation, building up, next mutation, building up, next mutation. And so the organisms are tracking or coursing their way through evolutionary phase space like water through a canyon. So what you want to what you want to think about as you look at this image is picture all these random events, the changes to the environment and changes to the phenotypes of organisms as being kind of like a constant rain falling down on this whole phase space diagram and just as rain would be channeled down into into the the channel or the valley and flow along in a similar way, you see how natural selection, which is anything but random, channels the mutations very efficiently through phase space. Once in a while, you have a few organisms, see a few dots up here in the valleys, the foothills. They're just barely making it up there. They're not very well adapted. They don't survive very well. And up here in the ta taller mountains, nothing makes it up there. Okay, so the principles here are that the number of organisms at each locus in phase space builds up until the probability the next step becomes inevitable. There's the principle that one step leads to another. By many small steps you can climb a mountain and by many small steps a dramatic change in organisms can occur over evolutionary time. Notice that evolution leaves behind what I call a trail of ancestors. See, look at that trail of all the ancestors that are still there, still beautifully adapted to their respective environments. In my class, someone always asked me, Dr. Rainbow, if humans have evolved from apes, they always think humans have evolved from apes, which they haven't, we've evolved from ape-like creatures, but they say, if humans have evolved from apes, why are there still apes in Africa? I always get that question every semester. And you should be able to easily see now that that's an exceedingly silly question. That's no different than asking why are there still fish five miles below the surface of the ocean? What's the answer? Because they're beautifully adapted to their environment. Another principle is that uh, evolution is a blind, random, fluky process driven by random mutations to DNA and random changes to the environment. Uh, but well, I already said that. It's, uh, the selection is anything but random. So in a supreme irony, this process, as I hope you may be able to see, even though it's driven by random processes, it ends up creating creatures that look just as if they'd been designed by a creator, which they really have, haven't they? because it's the creator who dictated Le Chatelier's principle and Coulomb's law and Newton's second law and the Schrodinger equation and all the laws that govern how the atoms and molecules self-assemble. So God still gets all the credit for this. In fact, he's an even more awesome God. Now, let me take stock of where I am. <clears throat> How many minutes over am I? Okay, I mean over my time? What? Oh, five minutes, okay. Because I need to respect the interplay that you've all come to see. So give me a second here to decide on how I want to use my time. I actually almost finished what I needed to there. Okay, what I'm going to do is simply make one last titanically important point about evolution. Now, what is it, what is it that you're all wondering the most about? This all makes a lot of sense. Uh, we know that this happens. Creationists freely admit that, that evolution takes place. They would say, however, that only microevolution can take place. I have no doubt at all that Dr. Hoven would agree with the fundamental essence of this picture, but he would say that you can only get small changes to organisms, like changing one insect into a different color or something like that. That's called microevolution. 
We want to, what you're wondering is, can you really go from things like a fish to an amphibian? Can you get big time evolution, big changes, big dramatic changes, which is called macro evolution? And what I'm going to do here is try to explain the results of the field that is, that I at least like to think of as my specialty, and which is called EvoDevo, or Evolutionary Developmental Biology. And I'm going to show you some animations that show how you can create radically new forms of organisms incredibly easily. All right, so I need to close this and open up this one. Okay, this is an animation I use in my class. Oh, let's see, did that open? No. Okay. I got too many things to hold here. Put it on the whole screen. Okay, living things are made of cells. And you have to understand that during embryological development, living cells can do seven different things. They can divide by mitosis, cell division, so things can get really big really fast. They can differentiate. They can turn into different kinds of cells, like here, two initially identical cells are turning into muscle cells and neurons uh, under the influence of a morphogen that's being sent by this cell. They can crawl around. Cells can crawl around anywhere at any time in your body, just like amoebas do. They can lay down extracellular matrix like big strands of collagen. They can change their shape. Here you see a cell in the middle changing its shape, so this epithelial sheet is buckling and folding. It's like take, uh, making a paper airplane. One of the things I do in my class is I take out a piece of paper, and in front of the students, I step by step make a paper airplane. And then at the end, I hold it up and I say, look, look what a complicated thing I made just by doing one thing, folding paper. I take a piece of clay that looks like this, and I cut it with a knife, boom, 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 and I make a hand. Did you know that your hand got here? By, you used to have a paddle like a duck. You had flesh in between your fingers, and then your cells here died by a, pro, by a process called programmed cell death or apoptosis, which generated your fingers. That's another of the things that they can do. They can, cells can commit suicide at any time, and they can attach together or break apart at any time by expressing cell adhesion molecules. So. <clears throat> With these facts in mind, <coughs> we go to another animation, which I call infinite outcomes <coughs> animation. And here we have five different uh, subdivisions of it. In the first animation, we're going to see how cells can divide and differentiate and just, uh, just look at how fast things can get complicated. Okay, they're dividing. You have two kinds of cells, blue and yellow. See, there we made something fairly complicated just by going through a few rounds of cell division and differentiation into only two types of cells. You have more than 200 kinds of cells. Okay, and then the second animation is an example of what we call a progress zone or a proliferation zone. This occurs, for example, in the limbs of, a, of an animal. The cells are constantly dividing on the leading edge there. And then if we do the same thing, but put in differentiation, now we get different colors. The cells can divide and differentiate in a proliferation zone or a progress zone. And then the next one shows same thing, except the cells are going to die at the end. They're going to die. Boom, there they go. See, so just by dying, you can make 
many, many structures inside of an embryo. And then the last animation in this series is a progress zone with differentiation and at, at the end they crawl. See, they crawl around and they can go anywhere at any time. So I think that you can see just from these simple animations that you put together all seven things, you can make anything that you want by simply changing the order in which living cells do those seven different things. And I tell my students, this would be insulting to creationists, I suppose, but the only difference between you and a fish is the order in which these seven things have happened. And by changing DNA, by changing DNA, you can alter the order in which things happen. Now, I am not even close to finishing, <laughs> but I have to stop, and I'm going to stop, and I'm looking forward to hearing Dr. Hoven. Thank you so much for coming. This place is jammed. I don't know how many are in the hallway, but we have a lot of folks here tonight. It's an honor to be here. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science 15 years, and now I travel and do seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I take the position the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. God made everything in six literal 24-hour days, and the evolution theory currently being taught in our schools is one of the dumbest and most dangerous religions in the history of humanity. That's my take on it, okay? Now, People are welcome to believe all that stuff, but I don't think they should teach it at taxpayers' expense in public schools. That ought to be taught in private schools at, you know, personal expense. Okay. This, uh, not my wife, just a picture. Um, I have three kids, all married, and the dog died, so I made it. I'm home free. It's wonderful. And we have two grandkids and hopefully 20 more coming. It's great. I have in my backyard Dinosaur Adventure Land. We like science. We like dinosaurs, but we think God ought to get the glory for his creation. If you get an opportunity to come to Dinosaur Adventure Land in Pensacola, Florida, we'd love to have you. You may also want to come to our uh, first ever and hopefully first annual uh, creation conference. We've had 25,000 visitors in the first two years at Dinosaur Adventure Land. You guys need to start one out here. That would be great. Uh, we need to use science and creation to glorify God. This September is our uh, creation conference if you want to sign up. The folks at the table don't know about this, but there's supposed to be a list out there. You might want to grab a notepad, Ken Andrew. And, uh, <laughs> If anybody wants to sign up, we'll send you information if you're interested. Or just call my office and say, send me stuff on the Creation Conference if you want to come. Or be better yet, come visit our ministry. We have about 40 people in our ministry. God's given us an awesome staff. And we try to use our efforts to build, produce materials that will strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Okay. Now, uh, right here. What's the evidence for evolution? All the evidence that I have seen in my 30-some years of studying this is just simply imagination or computer-generated graphics which doesn't say, that doesn't even show it happened. That's, you know, how we think it might have happened. None of, that, none of that is science, okay? Science is things we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. So what's the evidence for evolution? I happen to like science. I collect science books. I have hundreds of them. I taught the subject for 15 years. I really enjoy science. People say, there's evidence for evolution. Okay, I don't think so. We'll talk about that in a minute. And they say, couldn't God have used evolution to get us here? Well, we need to define some terms. There are six different meanings to the word evolution. I cover this in my seminar. First, there'd have to be cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter. Where did that come from? Secondly, there'd have to be chemical evolution. If the Big Bang theory is true, the Big Bang produced hydrogen. You'll never hear them talk about this, but it had to happen because you have to somehow get uranium from hydrogen. That simply is not possible. Thirdly, there'd have to be stellar evolution. That's the origin of stars. Nobody's ever seen a star form. All we see are stars blow up. That's the opposite of evolution. There's novas or supernovas. We don't see them form. One professor I debated said, oh, we're seeing, a, we're seeing a star form right now in Crab Nebula. I said, no, you're not. You're seeing a spot get brighter. And you're assuming it's a star forming. It could be the dust is clearing. There's already a star behind it. You don't know any stars are forming. What we do know, there's a lot of stars out there. There's enough that everybody on Earth can own 11 trillion of them to yourself. <laughs> We've never seen one star form. So, Fourthly, we have what's called organic evolution, the origin of life. The evolutionist has a serious problem with this one, getting over going from non-living material to living organisms. Now, Dr. Rainbow and I talked before this debate, and we agreed we would only limit this discussion to once life begins, how did it evolve? 
Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about. I don't think there's any evidence for that either. But I think skipping the first four steps would be fatal for students to realize, to, to, not, to not realize these are essential steps the evolutionist is simply trying to avoid because they don't have an answer for any of those. Lastly, or fifthly, we have what's called macroevolution. This is where an animal changes to a different kind of animal. Nobody has ever observed any of this. We never see a dog produce a non-dog. You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you're going to get a dog, and there are limits to these changes. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> you're never going to get a, big as dog as a, a dog as big as Texas or a dog as small as a flea. There are limits. Sure, there are changes, but there are limits. And the further you get from the norm, the more problems you have. You start having hip dysplasia and disease resistance goes down and stuff like that. So the normal average generic mutt is probably where it started. And now all these special breeds we've created, like the Chihuahua, definitely swimming in the shallow end of the gene pool, are <laughs> certainly basically useless in my book. But, uh, but every, kid knows, every kid knows that a dog, a wolf, and a coyote are the same kind of animal. We do this in churches. I'll say, I get a five-year-old kid, and I'll say, which one of these is different, boys and girls? The dog, the wolf, the coyote, or the banana? They pick it out almost every time. One kid said, the boy, and well, <laughs> it's the banana. Okay. Um, the Bible says the animals will bring forth after their kind. Now, Charlie Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of Species. The argument is not about the origin of species. The argument's about the origin of kinds. I'm not sure who's deciding when a new species has been created or not. You know, a dog and a wolf are different species, but they're obviously the same kind of animal. I'd like to meet the guy who's making the decision. This is a new species, okay? It's still the same kind. Lastly, we have what's called microevolution. I don't like the term. I think it's confusing. We should just call it a variation within the kind. But whatever you call it, number six happens. That one I agree with. All the first five are purely imagination. Students have to be taught to believe in these by computer animations or, you know, pictures of how it might have happened. It all takes place in the imagination. It never takes place in reality. People say, couldn't God use evolution to get us here? Well, that depends what you mean by God. The God that would use evolution is cruel, wasteful, stupid, he's deceitful, he's not the God of the Bible, that's for sure. It's not in the character of God to use misfits, blind chance, and death. My God gets it right first time. He doesn't have to practice, okay? <coughs> Jacques Monod, a Nobel Prize winner, said, natural selection is the blindest, most cruel way of evolving new species and more and more complex and refined organisms. The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which the whole modern ethics revolts. An ideal society is a non-selective society, one where the weak is protected, which is exactly the opposite of the so reverse of the so-called natural law. I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God more or less set up in order to have evolution. I'm surprised also that Christians try to blend evolution with creation. David Hull, Northwest University said, Whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural selection may be like, he is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is also not a loving God who cares about his productions. He is not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. Charlie Darwin said in his book, Thus, from the war of nature and famine and the death, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving, the production of higher animals follows. Evolution is a religion of death and stru struggle and cruelty. It is not compatible with the scriptures. My Bible says God's work is perfect. He made it right first time. The God that would use evolution is deceitful. It's not the God of the Bible. There's no evidence for evolution anyway. The Bible says God formed the world by his word. He spoke it into existence. He did it in six days. He told us clearly how he did it. He didn't use millions of years to get here. I think it'd be a retarded God that can't make it right first time. I wouldn't worship a God like that, okay? It nullifies the need for the death of Christ by having God use this evolutionary process, and there is no evidence for evolution. So why would we compromise a perfectly good Bible, which has never been proven wrong, with a dumb theory that has never been proven right? I see no reason to compromise in this war, okay? Are, do, are they the same? No, the Bible and evolution are absolutely backwards in every respect. We could spend an hour talking about this one. They're irreconcilably different. <clears throat> evolution says uh, death brought man into the world. The Bible says man brought death into the world. The differences are impossible to, to reconcile. Somebody is wrong. And I enjoy showing them who they are. Okay, now, <laughs> suppose I said, Suppose I said, I have a theory that the moon is made of green cheese. Okay. It's okay to have a dumb theory. That's perfectly fine. Then, suppose I said, NASA proved it when they went there in 1973 on a secret mission. Well, it's okay to have a dumb theory, but it's not okay to use lies to support my theory, right? 
It's even worse to use tax dollars to get paid while I lie to support my theory. So if there's evidence for evolution, I really want to see it. The textbook says, you're an animal and share a common heritage, heritage with earthworms. This is ludicrous, okay? If you want to believe your great-great-grandpa was a worm, you go ahead and believe that, but don't use my tax dollars to teach that to my kids, okay? You go teach that to your kids at your religious school. Now, they say they have evidence for evolution. They say they have evidence from fossils. I'm telling you, folks, in a court of law, fossils wouldn't hold up one second as evidence. You bring in your bones and say, these bones are the ancestors of us today. They're going to laugh at you and say, uh, Your Honor, he can't prove those bones had any kids. <laughs> he sure can't prove they had different kids. Absolutely no fossils could possibly count in this discussion. When you find fossils in the dirt, all you know is it died. <laughs> so don't tell me fossils are evidence for evolution. They talk about the fossil record. I say, hold it, first place, there is no fossil record. There are a bunch of bones in the dirt. It's not a record, okay? There aren't dates on them. There are just a bunch of bones in the dirt. There's just as much evidence for a flood. They say they have evidence from structure, evidence from molecular biology, evidence from development, like you talked about tonight. Well, we're going to talk about some of those as quick as we can. The textbook started off with the assumption that the universe is billions of years old and started with the Big Bang. I think that theory is ludicrous and has been proven wrong years ago. That's not science. We cover that in great detail on our video number one out there on the table. Uh, if you want to get one of those, there's not many left. Sorry about that. But they tell the Earth, they can tell the kids that radioactive dating proves things are millions of years old. That is also not evidence for evolution. Radioactive dating is ridiculous. We cover that thoroughly on video seven. Here's an example where living snails were carbon dated 27,000 years old. They're still alive, okay? <laughs> This is 1984. I give many examples on video number seven about that. This guy said, in the last two years, an absolute date has been obtained for the Gandong beds. It has the interesting value of 300,000 years, plus or minus 300,000 years. <laughs> Boy, they nailed that one right on the head, didn't they? Anyway, get video seven if you want more on carbon dating or potassium argon dating or uranium, uranium lead dating. I got them all on video seven. So they tell the kids the Earth is billions of years old. That is not evidence for evolution. Even if the Earth were billions of years old, there's still no evidence for evolution. And I think there's ample evidence the Earth is not billions of years old, and we cover that on video number one of our series. They tell the kids, the Earth started off hot, and it slowly cooled down. Yet the Bible says the Earth was created underwater. It was never a hot molten mass. The scientific evidence points to the fact that the Bible is right, because all over the world, radio polonium halos are found. Very short half-life on polonium 218 and 214, like down to, you know, less than three minutes. And you can get the book, go to halos.com if you want a whole lot more on the radio polonium halos. They prove positively the Earth was never a hot molten mass. Cover that on video seven. Textbook says the uh, stalactites form slowly, very slowly, tiny drops of water. That is not evidence for evolution. It's not evidence for anything. It's not even true. Here's me standing by a stalagmite. It's only 100 years old in Thermopolis, Wyoming. Okay, it happens very quickly. This is not a stalagmite, actually. This is a, a flowstone uh, formation from simply minerals in mineral water being pumped out of a pipe. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and by one man, sin came into the world, and death by sin. Yet Darwin said, death brought man into the world. Somebody's wrong, folks. Did man bring death into the world, or did death bring man into the world? Don't try to compromise the two. Get on or get off. Somebody's wrong, okay? Textbook says, this is Grandpa. <laughs> 30 million years ago, larger primates, such as monkeys and apes, evolved. They are ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Look, you're welcome to believe that, but that's not science. It's not observable science, that's for sure. That's not grandpa, okay. Um, now, all of the so-called evidence for evolution from the cavemen that I'm aware of, and I've studied it real actively now for 30-some years, all of it has been discredited. I mean, you pick your caveman, Homo erectus, Java man, Piltdown man, Lucy, they've all been discredited. This, this article in the newspaper says, he's the daddy of us all. This is silly. You don't know he's the daddy of anybody. <laughs> all you know is you found some bones in the dirt. That's all you know. You can't prove he had any kids that lived. Don't tell me he's the daddy of us all. They're lying to you, okay? <laughs> Cover much more on the caveman in video number two. They tell us dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. That is simply not true. There's ample evidence dinosaurs have always lived with man. We cover that for two hours, for two and a half hours on our video number three. Textbook says the Colorado River cut the Grand Canyon slowly over millions of years. That's ludicrous. The top of Grand Canyon is higher than both ends. Rivers don't flow uphill. Grand Canyon's a washed out spillway. Anybody that studies it'll know that. I flew down it two days ago coming here, looking, took a bunch of pictures flying down you know, across Grand Canyon. It's a one mile rise spread out over 270 miles, so you don't notice it much, but it, it's, it's not formed by the Colorado River. 
The textbooks tell the kids each of the layers of rock is a different age. The whole geologic column is baloney. It doesn't exist any place on Earth except the textbooks. There is no geologic column. This guy admits it. He said if there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. It's a great theory, but it's not science. It's not observable. You can have all the theories you want, but I want to, where's the beef? Where's the evidence, okay? All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting these layers. Now here they are telling us these layers are different ages, and yet we got petrified trees connecting them. They're not different ages, folks. They all formed in one big flood in the days of Noah. We cover that on video number four about the geologic column. Okay, textbook says the Devonian period is characterized by the lobe-finned fish, like we heard about tonight. Well, they say this is proof of evolution, that it slowly evolved from fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. Just memorize the word farm and you got it, F-A-R-M, fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. This is what they imagine it might have happened like, but it is pure imagination. And the lobe-finned fish are still very much alive. When they found the coelacanth swimming around the Indian Ocean back in 1938, they brought one into the uh, scientists and they said, wow, look at this, they survived for 300 million years. Never dawned on them one time to question the theory because the theory is sacred. The evidence must fit the theory. Now go, see the way science is supposed to work. You get a theory, you check the evidence. If the evidence says, nope, the theory's not right, you throw the theory away. You get a new theory. That's the way it's supposed to work. And it does work that way in science with everything except this evolution theory. And I think I know why. I think it's because the only alternative to evolution is creation. And if creation is true, then there's a creator. And if there's a creator, there might be some rules. You mean like, thou shalt not? Ooh, we don't want those rules. So we're going to deny the creator. That's really what it boils down to in every instance. The lobe fin fish is still alive. The textbooks tell the kids, you can tell the evidence for evolution because of the similar forelimb structures. This one says, these homologous structures provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. And they show the two bones in the wrist of all kinds of different animals. This is silly. This textbook says, comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. The commonality suggests these and other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. That is ludicrous. They probably have a common designer is why they're similar. The different bones develop from different genes on the chromosomes. And even if they were coming from the same genes on the chromosomes and they're not, that still wouldn't be evidence for evolution. It could be evidence for a common designer. And they're so complex, complex things don't happen automatically. Somebody has to create them. You know, doing an imagination, a computer animation of how it might have happened, that's not science. That's imagination. The lug nuts from a Pontiac will fit on a Chevy. <laughs> you go try it. They will. That proves they both evolved from a Honda 14 million years ago. <laughs> no, that proves the same guys are making them, okay? It's common designer. Textbooks are going to tell your kids that the peppered moth is evidence for evolution. This was proven wrong years ago. The peppered moth, according to the story, had dark babies and light babies, but on the light-colored trees, the light ones blended in better, and the dark ones got eaten, eaten more. And then when they burned coal in the factories, the trees turned dark, and the dark ones blended in better, and the light ones got eaten. And so they say the population ratio shifted from 95% light to 95% dark. Well, the problem is the whole story is baloney. It didn't happen. They glued dead moths on the tree to take that picture for your kid's textbook. After 40 years of watching, they found two moths on the trees. Two in 40 years. What's 95% of two? Uh, so if you have evidence for evolution, I really want to see it. However, the peppered moth is not evidence for evolution. Even if the story were true, all they had was a shift in the population ratio. That's proof of a designer giving his creatures the ability to produce a variety of offspring so some will always survive. That's still evidence for creation, if the story were true, not, not evidence for evolution. The idea of the embryo having gill slits has is, is been proven wrong years ago. This textbook says the presence of fish-like structures in embryos of different species shows these animals have evolved from fish and show the basic pattern of fish development. This is simply not true. They say it has gills like a fish. Just because the skin is wrinkled up, I got the same wrinkles in my elbow and behind my knee. It doesn't prove a thing. You got wrinkles. Some of you got a lot of wrinkles on your body, actually. But um, <laughs> what does that prove? Okay, I'm getting them too. All right. Okay. Now, the textbook, though, says the presence of gills and tails is evidence of a common ancestor. This is not true. This junior high textbook says the similarities provide evidence that these three animals evolved from a common ancestor. Again, talking about the gill slits. This has been proven wrong years ago. 1875, it was proven wrong. It's not true. This textbook says humans and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. 
Now look, I don't mind if somebody wants to believe that. But I resent paying for that to go into a textbook, and that's the only answer the kid's given. I further resent them cutting down a perfectly good tree to print that, okay? And we need Al Gore on this one. Okay, those little folds of skin develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. Just because the skin is wrinkled up doesn't mean it's gills or even it's partly gills or even it's related to gills. I've seen people with a bunch of chins and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one, okay? <coughs> Ernst Haeckel faked his drawings in 1869 to make people believe this evolution theory. He admitted he lied in 1875 when his own university held a trial. He was convicted of fraud. On top are Haeckel's drawings. Underneath are the actual photographs of those creatures he claimed he's drawing a picture of. The drawings are simply fraudulent. They're lies. There's no kind way to say it. They're lies. Get them out of the textbook. They tell the kids in school, the appendix is evidence of evolution because your appendix is smaller than a horse's. Well, we don't eat as much, you know, green vegetables as horses eat. Maybe you're not, we don't dig up as much junk as they do in, in baiting off the ground. But the fact is, you do have a smaller appendix than a horse. So what? That's all you need. The appendix, they'll say it's vestigial. It's not vestigial. You need your appendix, okay? If your appendix is taken out, you shorten your lifespan, I believe, by about eight years. You got a much better chance of getting a lot of diseases. The appendix is where a part of the immune system is responses are initiated. They've known that for years. It's not vestigial. This textbook tells the kids, one of the evidences for evolution is the whale's vestigial pelvis. Many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. This is baloney. They say the whale has a vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. <laughs> That's not true. Here's from Los Angeles Museum. Those are the bones they're talking about right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. <laughs> Actually, this is a lie. Those bones are used in reproduction. The, the whales are pretty big, and those little bones have special muscles that attach to them that allow the whales to reproduce. It has nothing to do with walking on land. This is not evidence for evolution. This is evidence for design, okay? In our museum in Florida, we have a 15 and a half foot python snake skin. Down at the south end of that skin, you can see little claws that are attached to little bitty bones going up inside the snake's body. The textbook says these are rudimentary hind legs of a python snake. This is not true. Those little claws are used in mating. The snake can't talk. He can't say screwed over, okay? This has nothing to do with walking on land. It has to do with getting baby snakes. So, if you have evidence for evolution, I'd like to see it, but that's not evidence for evolution, okay? This guy says the humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. The vestigial tailbone in humans is homologous to the functional tail of other primates. Thus, vestigial structures can be viewed as evidence for evolution. Organisms having vestigial structures probably share a common ancestry. Well, look, you're welcome to believe that, but it's not true, okay? The tailbone's not vestigial. You need your tailbone. There are nine muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which there are quite a few functions you cannot perform. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those, okay? Now, <laughs> if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I have a long time standing offer. I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over, okay? Uh, me, me and the Swiss Army can fix this in 15 minutes. Now, uh, this textbook, though, says the coccyx, the tailbone, is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function and is thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree-living ancestor. First, it's not true. It's been proven wrong years ago. Secondly, that ought to be taught in a school for religion, not a school for science. This is not part of science. Why is this in a science book? Take that out of the book. A tail would be handy. I mean, anyway, this textbook draws, draws what's called a, a phylogenetic tree, and they have humans, birds, and crocodiles having a common ancestor. It only takes place on paper in the imagination. It never takes place in reality. Darwin said it's a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Well, Charlie, you're welcome to believe that. But that's not science. And I resent that being taught in science classes at taxpayer expense. And I think many other people do also. That's not evidence for evolution. The fact that you believe it doesn't make it true. Um, they talk about natural selection being the cause. He mentioned tonight natural selection. So I agree, natural selection works but it only selects. It doesn't design a thing. It doesn't create anything. If I was going to select, a, if I wanted a population of people over 10 feet tall, so I'm going to go around and kill everybody under 10 feet tall. I don't have anybody over 10 feet to select from. You can't get a population of 10-footers because there's nothing to select from. 
You can select, natural selection does that, it doesn't create a thing. The textbooks tell the kids about the horse being evidence for evolution. They say we went from a four-toed horse to a one-toed horse. That is baloney, proven wrong 55 years ago. But they're still teaching it. They say we started from complex chemical soup and went to a living organism very slowly. Oh yeah. This textbook says all the many forms of life on Earth today descended from a common ancestor. Then it says, no traces of those events remain. <laughs> we know what happened, but there's no proof. <laughs> well, you know what happened because of your imagination. You don't know what happened because of scientific evidence. It's not science. That's all I'm saying. This is not evidence for evolution. The fact that you can write it on paper, or the fact that some famous scientist, Dobzhensky, says, oh, this is true, or that, therefore it's true. <laughs> it doesn't make it true because some famous scientist says it's true. Where's the beef? Where's the evidence? And they talk about a simple single-celled organism. S single-celled organisms are not simple, folks. One paramecium is more complex than a space shuttle. And you can put thousands of those in a drop of water. Michael Behe's got a great book out called Darwin's Black Box, if you want to read about the complexity of living organisms. He spends a whole chapter talking about the complexity of the hair on a bacteria. The whole chapter about one hair on a bacteria attached to a little motor that's a rotary engine. That little motor is incredible. It turns 100,000 RPM forward or backward, and it's just like, it, as your things get smaller, the fluid they move through feels thicker to them, so bacteria swimming through water is like a person swimming through peanut butter, and this bacteria goes 60 miles an hour. That little motor is so tiny, if you took a hair off your head and cut it off, you could put eight million of those motors on the stump of that hair, and it turns 100,000 RPM. Had to be designed, folks. Now, if you want to believe it happened by chance, you go ahead and believe that. But that's not logical, and it's not science. Now, this textbook says the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. Well, again, they're welcome to believe that, but the eyeball is incredibly complicated. Darwin knew the eyeball was complex and said it gave him a headache. Darwin said to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. By the way, how can blind chance make a seeing eye? Hmm? On the back of your eyeball, you have about one square inch called the retina. In that one square inch, there are 137 million light-sensitive cells, all of them wired to the brain. I've done quite a bit of building in my life. I've hooked up quite a few electrical wires. Can you imagine wiring an eye with 137 million connections in one square inch? My Heavenly Father did it. He's pretty smart, ain't he? I debated an atheist in uh, New York. He said, I've got proof for evolution. The human eye is poorly designed. I said, why do you say that? He said, well, the light comes into the eye, and then at the back, when it, before it hits the retina, it goes through blood vessels. And the blood vessels block part of the light. He said, the octopus has a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. Humans have blood vessels in front of the retina. That's a poor design. He said, that's proof for evolution. I said, well, wait, wait. First of all, poor design is not proof for evolution, okay? Porsche designed a car one year. They accidentally made it where you had to jack up the motor to change the spark plugs. That's a poor design. But it doesn't prove nobody made it, okay? So arguing from, arguing from poor design is not a good argument for evolution. But the eye is not poorly designed. I told this atheist I debated, I said, sir, listen, um, the humans live in the air, okay? Air is a very poor insulator for UV light. UV light will burn your retina. Now, so you have blood vessels in front of your retina, to block out the UV light. Octopus live in the water, okay? Now, water blocks UV light. So they don't mind having their blood vessels behind the retina. They're designed for living in water and you're designed for living in air. I said, if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you just go ahead, but you're going to be blind in a few days, okay? It's not evidence for evolution. Don't give me this poor design of the human eyeball. And kids, if you go to college, you're going to hit a professor who'll tell you that, okay? They're either confused about their anatomy or they're lying to you. It's not poor design, okay? The textbook talks about how life evolved from non-living material. Uh, we could spend an hour on this one, about how they did not use oxygen intentionally. We covered that on video four, about the uh, origin of life experience. We're not gonna talk about that tonight. This textbook says, gills are an adaptation to living in water. Well, how did they live before they adapted the gills? Well, you see boys and girls for millions of years, none of them lived, they all died <laughs> until they evolved the gills. Why don't they say it's a design feature? They don't want to say it's a design feature because then come kids, some kid's going to say, who's the designer? They always use this word adapted. Heard it about six times tonight. These are adapted. These are adapted. No, they're designed for what they do, okay? 
This textbook says humans and orangutans are 96% similar in their DNA. So what? They say, well, that proves a common ancestor 15 million years ago. No, it doesn't. Actually, they, this textbook says, uh, Darwin speculated all forms of life are related. This speculation has been verified. That is baloney. Verified by DNA. The DNA is unbelievably complicated. One person's DNA, all the DNA out of your body would fill about two tablespoons. But if you tied them end to end and stretched them out, it'd reach from Earth to the moon and back five million round trips. Unbelievably complex. Didn't happen by chance. Okay. But now they're telling the kids, like uh, Richard Goldschmidt said, clear back in 1940, the first bird hatched from a reptile egg. He, 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 he was frustrated because they couldn't find any evidence for evolution. You couldn't find any fossils that are missing links. He said, so it must have happened quickly because we don't find the evidence. This is silly, okay? In the mind of the evolutionist, there's only two choices. They'll say evolution happened slowly like Darwin said, or evolution happened quickly like Gould said. They don't seem to be capable of thinking outside the box. It didn't happen at all. They don't want to think about that, okay? Um, this guy says evolution is a fact. Evidence for evolution from the fossils. He said the fossil record provides some of the strongest evidence that species evolved over time. That is silly. There is no fossil record. There is a bunch of fossils in the dirt, but it's not a fossil record. Don't let them pull that one over on you. All you find are bones in the dirt. You don't look back in the fossil record. Fossils only exist in the present. You put your interpretation on them, but they exist in the present. Everything else is your interpretation on there. See, the creationists and the evolutionists are both seeing the same evidence, coming to different conclusions. I look at fossils and see evidence of rapid burial and a flood. The evolutionists look at fossils and look for evidence for how they change from one thing to another. We don't see anything changing today like that. Why would you think it was different long ago and far away? Um, they say birds are descendants of dinosaurs. Well, you're welcome to believe that, but there are a few differences between a dinosaur and a bird, okay? You don't just put a few feathers on them and say, come on, give it a try, man. It won't hurt too bad. <laughs> it's just not quite that simple, okay? Textbook will say Archaeopteryx is evidence for evolution. Archaeopteryx is a bird, okay? Alan Fiducia, University of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, one of the world's experts on, he believes in evolution, but he says, Paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx to an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. Students believe evolution because that's what they've been taught. I think all that's been presented are lies. I think the lies ought to be taken out of the books, and then if you have evidence for your theory, show it to the kids. They tell them they're an animal. What's it do? <laughs> well, look around, okay? They act like animals. Now, <coughs> Teen suicide rates gone crazy in this country. Violent crimes have gone up a thousand percent since evolution became the dominant theory in the early 60s. Unmarried couples living together in adulteries increased 725 percent. Premarital or a teen, pre, a teen uh, uh, premarital sex has gone up in every category. Um, Satan's a liar, folks. He wants to deceive you. And I think if somebody believes that we came from an ape-like ancestor or even came from an amoeba up to a human, they're welcome to believe that. But that's not science. It's not common sense. And I think they need to understand that teaching is going to destroy the faith of some kids in their class, which maybe they don't understand, maybe they do understand. But Jesus said, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So before I taught evolution to anybody, I'd take a long, hard look at Jesus' warning. I mean, if you don't believe he existed, don't believe he's God, that's fine. But listen carefully to his warning. You're in serious trouble. What should we do? Well. 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to public schools reject the faith after one year of college. After they're subjected to a whole semester or a whole year or four whole years of computer animations of how it might have happened, pretty soon they start to get confused and start to believe it. That's what happens to many of them. Scott wrote me a letter. He said, Dr. Oven, until I went to college, my faith in God was sound. But my college history class helped destroy that faith. Folks, evolution's not just in science class. It's in history, English, math, every class, okay? Scott said, I started to doubt the Bible and God's Word, even started to doubt Jesus was truly God's Son and that He died and rose from my sins. My best friend showed me your tapes and I was in awe of what I saw. Everything I thought, thought I knew about life was changed. Yea, he rescued one. Charles Darwin, studied to be a preacher, lost his faith. Farrell Till, former Church of Christ missionary, now the editor of an atheist magazine. I debated him, debate number seven on the table. 
Tom, uh, Michael Shermer, editor of Skeptics Magazine here in California, I debated him. Um, I don't know when that was. Claimed he was a Christian as a kid. Tom Hanks, stars in movies with little or no morals, claimed he was a Christian and loved the Lord when he was 16. Gary Parker, now teaches back to a creationist. Michael Ruse, the main spokesman at the Arkansas trial, was raised in a Christian home, spoke out against creation. John Templeton, who used to work with Billy Graham, accepted evolution and wrote a book, Farewell to God. Frank Zindler, studied to be a Lutheran priest. He's the president of the Ohio Atheist Association. I debated him. And we're going to get Matt Rainbow off the list here by the end of the night because uh, I'm getting him back to be a creationist. All right. <coughs> Moses Mordecai, Mordecai Marx Levy, alias Karl Marx, when he was 17, wrote a paper on how much he loved the Lord. Then he went off to college, studied philosophy. First year in college, somebody destroyed his faith. Later he said, my objective in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. Karl Marx, the father of communism. Marx tried to dedicate his book to uh, Charles Darwin. He said on the title page, to Charles Darwin from a sincere admirer, Karl Marx. Marx knew communism wouldn't work without the evolutionary theory. See, our American system is founded on the idea that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain rights. Communism is founded on the idea that all men evolve from slime and you're nothing but an animal. Major difference. We covered that on video number five. Karl Marx had six children. Three died of starvation in infancy. Two others committed suicide. Not what you consider a sec successful father. Okay? Is that with my extra minutes I get or that's just a regular? Okay, good. Okay. At a very early age, while still a pupil at the ecclesiastical school, Christian school, comrade Stalin, Joseph Stalin, developed a critical mind and revolutionary sentiments. He began to read Darwin and became an atheist. Joseph Stalin went to a Christian school as a kid. Joseph Stalin read that book and it changed his life forever. Joseph Stalin's responsible for killing somewhere between 60 and 100 million of his own people. I've got several people on my staff, including my daughter-in-law, who are from Ukraine, where 10 million people were killed by Joseph Stalin's goons in the Ukraine. Andrew Carnegie said he loved the Lord, wanted to serve God with his life. First year in college, he fell into believing in evolution. He said, man, if evolution's true, then I'm going to apply this to the business world. The strongest survive. And you won't understand the history of the trust busters and all that stuff that had to happen in the late 1800s until you understand how evolutionary thinking ties in. Carnegie left money behind to start an organization, which is still running, up in Berserkley, California, called the National Center for Science Education. The purpose of the National Center, the current president is Dr. Jeannie Scott. Their whole purpose is to keep creation out of schools and keep evolution in the schools. And if you try to do anything to get evolution out of your schools, the National Center for Science Education will be down your throat at Carnegie's expense. And he used to love the Lord. What happened? President Roosevelt. Good man in many ways, but he fell into believing this evolution theory, which teaches, you know, of course, one race is better than another. Roosevelt thought the Indians were an inferior species. You won't understand what happened to the Indians in the last 150 years until you understand how evolution ties into the thinking. That's why we were so mean to the Indians. Uh, E.O. Wilson at Harvard University said, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolution theory. First year in college, destroyed his faith. Philip Wentworth, back in 1932, said, when I entered Harvard in the fall of 24, I was not only a Christian, I was also an avowed candidate for the ministry. Then for four years, I underwent a process of mental readjustment that shook my little world to its foundations. Through it all, only one thing was clear to me, if I could reconcile religion with intelligence, I knew I could go on into the, my chosen career fortified by the experience. If I could not, every consideration of honor would compel me to make other plans. In the end, I gave up the ministry. Folks, there is no conflict between intelligence and the Bible. There is no conflict between science and the Bible. There is a great conflict between evolution and the Bible. And there's a great conflict between evolution and science. But they want you to think evolution and science go together. No. Beer is sold at football games quite a lot. Beer has nothing to do with football. And beer does not become athletic by association with football. Okay? The fact that evolution is currently in our science textbooks does not make it part of science. I'm sorry that it's there. I'm working to get rid of it. But in the meantime, don't fall for this idea that, well, it's in the books. It must be part of science. No, it's not. Okay? I think if you love your kids, you ought to get them out. I don't think it's possible to fix the problem on the short term. 
That's why about 12% of Americans now go to private school or Christian school. And the number's growing all the time. I don't think it's possible. I think you ought to get them out if you can, okay? The Bible says, Cease, my son, to hear instruction that causeth thee to err from the words of knowledge. But some of you people are more worried about Johnny going off to college, getting a, a certified degree so that he can make more money. You're more, you, the fact that three out of four are going to lose their faith doesn't bother you, just so he makes a lot of money in life. Better think long and hard about that one. This is how the atheists rate the different states on how well they treat evolution. They think the folks in California are doing a wonderful job of teaching evolution to their kids. They think the folks in Florida are doing a lousy job. Yay, Florida. Okay. <laughs> if you can't get them out, make sure your kids know the truth. Don't send them off unarmed. My video series is there to provide information. It's not copyrighted. Copy it all you want. Give it to your friends. If you don't like my jokes, edit them out, okay? The uh, <laughs> Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I think it's wonderful. You don't need to lay your brains at the door when you come study the Bible or study science or study creation. Everything I observe in nature says, wow, there must be an awesome designer. Not only did God design this world, he wants to have a personal relationship with his creation. It's wonderful. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. It's not because I'm good. Are you kidding? If I get what I deserve, I'm in serious trouble. I've been forgiven. That is awesome. And I certainly don't feel intellectually inferior for believing in creation. Quite the opposite. I look at the evidence and say, wow, this matches, it all matches, it's perfect. Um, Florida has laws requiring textbooks to be accurate. So does Texas, so does Wisconsin, so does Alabama, so does California. The textbooks ought to be accurate. I'm not trying to get evolution out of your schools. But all the evidence that's used to support the theory is wrong and ought to be taken out. Take the lies out of the books. Don't try to get evolution out of schools, get the lies out of the textbooks. You can demand they cut out the pages. I mentioned in a debate one time, I said, these following pages ought to be cut out of this book because they're not true. The professor said, uh, what are you going to replace it with? I said, what? He said, you want to cut these pages out of the book, what are you going to replace this with? I said, are you telling me if we take a lie out of the book, we can't take a lie out of the book until I get a replacement? How about shorten the book by 20 pages? The kids won't care. <laughs> what the professor was trying to avoid saying was, we don't have any real evidence for our theory except things that have been proven wrong. And if you take this out of the book, I'm stuck with nothing to prove my theory. Well, that's your fault. Don't blame me. You chose the dumb theory, not me. <laughs> get some evidence, okay? Glue the pages together, put a warning sticker in the front cover. You gotta get students my little brainwashed book. Our printing cost is a dollar a piece. Buy a thousand of them, give them to every kid in the county. Teachers will have a hard time teaching evolution for the next 10 years if you give those things out. Get your kid exempt from class. Say, teacher, I don't want my kid taught evolution. There's legal ways to make sure that you, they, they can't teach them evolution, okay? You can teach creation in the classroom. There's never been a law against it. In closing here, God doesn't lie. The Bible says God cannot lie. He promised, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 35 years ago next month, I said, Lord, uh, I'm a sinner. He said, you can say that again. <laughs> I said, yes, I know, Lord, but... Uh, and I, I, believe I deserve to go to hell. He said, you can say that again, too. I said, but Lord, I believe you died for me, and I want you to forgive me and save me right now. On February 9, 1969, I prayed and asked the Lord to forgive me, save me. Hey, where are you going when you die? You really ought to think about it. You're going to be dead for a long time. You're going to actually be dead longer than you're going to be alive. Think about that one. If we can help, it's what our ministry exists for. Uh, I appreciate the work going into the animations, but uh, folks, I'd have to say, in a court of law, it wouldn't hold up three seconds. It's, it's an imagination. It's an animation. It's not reality. We don't observe it. So the argument tonight is, where's the evidence for evolution? I'm still waiting to see it. Thank you so much. We will now enter the rebuttal period. I, I believe uh, Dr. Rainbow used 53 minutes, which is the first, so use your first rebuttal period, a little bit more, but we'll extend grace on that. So uh, you have now 10 minutes of rebuttal. Okay, uh, some things Dr. Rainbow said tonight that I think uh, I should not leave hanging. Uh, he said half the population of the U.S. population rejects evolution. I think the implication is because they reject it because they don't understand it. I think quite the opposite is true. I think they do understand it and reject it. How many of you think you do understand what the evolution is trying to teach and you still reject it? Now, the choice is for the evolutionist to look at these hands and say, well, you people are stupid. 
or to look at it and say, maybe there's a reason they're not getting it. And the evolutionist typically thinks, if I had, you know, 75 hours to show you all this stuff, I could make you believe in it. Well, that is, again, implying you're dumb, I'm smart. You know, you just don't know everything I know or else you'd believe like I believe. I think, I think the opposite is true. I think there are thousands of scientists who have studied this very carefully and thoroughly rejected the concept. It doesn't work. It doesn't happen. So uh, I, I would certainly uh, agree that over half the population doesn't believe in it, but I disagree that that means they're dumb. Actually, I think it means they're smart enough to realize that they, don't, they didn't get brainwashed with all this teaching. Um, he said, evolution is the central unifying principle of biology. This has been the mantra for the last 20 years. The evolutionists keep saying, oh, you have to teach evolution. This is the central unifying theme. Well, just because they say that doesn't mean it is. I could say creation is the central unifying theme of the world. And they would say, I disagree. Okay, well, just saying something doesn't make it true. And you hear this over and over, and I see this in the court cases as I read about what happened in, in textbooks. They say evolution is the central theme. Evolution has nothing to do with biology. You could learn all the muscles, all the bones, all the nerves, all the fibers of the body, and never study evolution. You can teach the kids, okay kids, flexors, extenders, biceps, triceps, deltoid, you know, rectus femoris, and all these muscles of the, of the body. You don't have to learn about it. If the kid says, well, how'd they get there? Well, we don't know. All we're, we're learning the anatomy. Here's how it works. Evolution is unnecessary. It's a useless theory, and I think it's counterproductive. I think it's a waste of classroom time. And I think it shows up on the test scores. Now as American kids test lower and lower and lower in their general knowledge of science because they waste so much time teaching that dumb theory. That's my totally unbiased opinion, okay? Um, <laughs> he said tonight that evolution glorifies God, okay? I will stand by my guns. It is not the God of the Bible. I debated Hugh Ross for three hours on the John Ankerberg show, and he was saying how that, you know, God needed millions of years to make this happen, and how the Neanderthals were, you know, soulless humans and all this stuff. I said, I am very concerned that when you and I say the word God, we're talking about two different things. I think you have a different God than I do, okay? I think Osama bin Laden believes in God, but he has a different God than I do, okay? Very different God than I do. So I don't think God used evolution. There's no evidence for it anyway. Why blame that on him, okay? <laughs> he says, atoms are self-assembled by a process we don't understand. Well, again, you're welcome to believe that, but that's, again, not science. I think the fact that atoms can self-assemble is evidence of design. The idea that in the beginning, you know, God created the heaven and the earth and God plus dirt equals humans, that's not a problem for me to believe. But time plus dirt equals humans is a real problem for me to believe. This computer right here is nothing but natural components. There's not, nothing supernatural about a computer. There's not a little man running around in there changing the numbers on the screen, okay? It can be understood by purely natural processes. However, it didn't assemble itself. It can't assemble itself. You couldn't even get a nut and a bolt to evolve by chance that would fit together let alone a 747. You couldn't get one nut on one bolt by blind chance. So if they want to believe all this happened, that's fine. But the atoms self-assemble because they're designed to do that. Okay? And as far as the assembly process, that's something I'd love to hear in evolution explain. How did we get from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction? Which evolved first, the male or the female? So you've got a real problem here. For as soon as you start going from asexual to sexual reproduction, you got to find two of the opposite sex in the same place at the same time. It's a big world, you know, they're talking billions of years. They got to find each other and be interested. Now you really got a problem, okay? So, uh, <laughs> lastly, uh, not almost lastly here, uh, three minutes, you say? Okay. He said, I mentioned that, okay. Uh, Lobe fin fish, he gave the picture of how it changed, and you can do a computer animation, and National Geographic does this all the time on TV. You know, they show the computer animations of them changing, morphing from one to another. That's not science. That's imagination. I don't know how they don't see that, but that's all it is, is imagination. He said, the only difference between you and a fish um, is the arrangement of molecules. Folks, there's a tremendous difference between you and a fish. Animals have a consciousness of themselves. They're alive. Humans have a consciousness of God. Vast difference between man and animals. The Bible talks clearly about that. I think that's obvious from, from uh, common experience. So, I see no evidence for evolution. I think the theory is useless. I think it's only supported by things that are proven wrong. 
and I resent paying for it in the textbooks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rainbow, you have, uh, we'll give you a 10, even though you use part of it. What I would like to do, what I was asked to do, is to talk about evidence for evolution. And I would like to show you the most powerful example that I'm aware of in organismal evolution. The story of how birds evolved from what are called theropod dinosaurs. Now, let's see, I want to, <clears throat> let me uh, forward up here to, okay, birds. Birds are, birds are exceedingly specialized with a vast array of very high-tech adaptations for flight. They've always been the quintessential example used by creationists of organisms that are far too complex and wonderful to have ever evolved spontaneously. They have weight-saving toothless beaks, astonishingly light hollow bones, stump-like tailbones, collarbones that act like flexing springs during flight, deep-keeled breastbones to anchor the powerful flight muscles, and special feet with reverse toes that allow them to perch. Most amazing of all, their arms and hands are highly modified to create wings, which act as perfect airfoils through the agency of feathers, special integumentary structures, which have historically been perhaps the single most difficult to explain structure in all of organismal biology. So uh, feathers, I think I'll defer talking about them for the moment. This is the theory that you've all heard about, that birds evolved from dinosaurs, there you see uh, a dinosaur that's called Bambi Raptor. And as you can see, it has feathers on it, but it, the feathers were not used to fly. The feathers were believed to have kept it warm, probably, since down feathers are the, feathers are the most insulating substance known to man. This picture shows some of the transitional forms from a National Geographic article. Sinosaur opteryx in the back here. <coughs> Caudyteryx, uh, some of the dromaeosaurs like Velociraptor, and then on to birds such as Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx was a bird, there's no question about it. Everybody agrees with that. And, uh, and then on to modern birds. Now, this is a pretty picture. Anybody can paint pretty pictures. But what's the actual evidence for this? Well, I've tried to assemble a sequence. Uh, this, okay, we think, that, we think that juvenile T. rexes may have actually had feathers, for example, uh, to keep them warm. Here are some actual fossils. And I think what I'll do is just show this sequence. I don't know if you're trying to film this or not, but if you are, it would be a good time to turn the lights out and catch this, because it's the star of the show now. <laughs> so here is a, let's see here. Okay, I've got, I'm going to show you a transitional sequence of organisms. And I'm going to show them to you first with no labels on them, just so you can get a feel for how the transitions are relatively smoothly occurring. Then we'll see the labels. And then I'm going to show you how the characteristics uh, or the traits of birds uh, accumulated in evolution step by step. So first of all, here's a... I decided to just start with a lobe fin fish because I talked about that. We jump up to, now let's see, I need to get this on the whole screen. You, slideshow. Thanks. Well, Is that what does it? Okay, thanks. No. I'm forgetting the command to uh, make it the whole screen here. Oh, 
that's right, that's right. There we go, I've used it about a thousand times. Okay, but now why is it going back there? I've got to get to... Okay, there it is. Okay, so here's a lobe fin fish uh, jumping huge macroevolutionary jump all the way up to a, a uh, amphibian here. That would take a huge amount of explaining. And just look with your eyes uh, at the sequence and how they're changing step by step in a what seems to me a pretty smooth transition into organisms that look more and more like birds. There's finally a modern bird and there's an eagle. Okay, now let's name these, a lobe fin fish. You can see the dates there. A primitive amphibian like Ichthyostega. Again, that was macroevolution right there. Uh, then we finally get to a primitive reptile called a cotylosaur, the first reptiles, an early archosaur, Proterosuchus, onto a thecodont called Euparcaria, and then a clearly bipedal organism, an early dinosaur, a theropod dinosaur, Another theropod dinosaur, one that is known to have feather-like structures on its body. A tetanurin dinosaur like Allosaurus, which was a huge tetanurin. A maniraptoran dinosaur like Velociraptor. These are believed to be the closest relatives to birds. An avian dinosaur the most primitive known bird, Archaeopteryx, another avian dinosaur called Confuciusornis, an advanced avian dinosaur, a nearly modern enantiornithine bird, or what's called an opposite bird, a modern bird, like a pigeon, which is classified by most experts as still a dinosaur, and another modern bird, like an eagle. So birds are considered to be feathered dinosaurs by probably 99% of all uh, professional biologists who are qualified to have an opinion on the matter. Now, this is the part that really talks about the evidence. So what I've done is I've shown here a list of all the traits that birds have. Okay, so all these traits are possessed by modern day birds. And I'm now going to show you the same exact sequence, and you're going to see how, as each organism comes up, you'll see highlighted in bright yellow the traits that that organism displays that are bird like. And the key thing to remember think of the phase space diagram that I showed you. Think of these organisms as chattering their way through evolutionary phase space being driven by natural selection processes where each of these organisms was not trying to make birds because evolution never knows where it's going. It's a free running random program. But uh, you'll see these traits appearing in bright yellow as we go through it. So here a lobe fin fish has just say something like a leg. Okay, then a primitive amphibian has a full-fledged leg, as birds obviously do. Okay, then getting closer to the real sequence that we're interested in. Uh, Cotylosaurs, the most primitive reptiles, have scales. Birds still have scales on their legs. And amniotic eggs, which birds lay. We go to an early archosaur or ruling reptile. You see the formation of what's called an antorbital fenestra. That means holes in the skull, holes in your skull. It makes your skull lighter. Birds have those to save weight. Okay, here we see a thecodont, euparcaria, and although this looks like he's walking on four legs, it is believed by many scientists that this was bipedal at least part of the time. 
So bipedalism is critical in bird evolution because it liberates your front limbs to do something different, like become wings. Okay, then we have another early dinosaur, Ornithosuchus, and here we see offset ball and socket hip joint, and you raise the metatarsals and you walk on your toes. Birds walk literally on their toes. Okay, a theropod dinosaur like Coleophysis. This had hollow bones, as birds do, a pelvis anchors on more vertebrae, as in birds. It has a tremendously shortened thigh bone right here. Uh, a reduced fibula, elevate first toe off the ground. We'll skip over that. We come to a theropod dinosaur with proto feathers, filamentous proto feathers. Down feathers, perhaps. Jump to a tetanurin dinosaur called Allosaurus, which has a strong fused sternum, fused clavicle or wishbone, and a three fingered hand. A Manny Raptoran dinosaur, like Velociraptor, has a semi lunar carpal, which allows you to slash, get a slashing hand stroke. A swept back pubic bone, as in birds, a shortened trunk. Go to an avian dinosaur like Archaeopteryx. You get a split propulsion left wing, fully modern flight feathers, lateral facing shoulder joint, and a reversed hallux for a perching toe. Matt, time's up. Time's up. Time's up. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, here we have uh, pieced together from fragmentary evidence. I've been able to reconstruct the evolution of silverware. <laughs> You can see these two knives, these two spoons here. Obviously, one's been uh, subjected to more geologic pressure and has squished it out a little deeper than the other. I believe knives slowly turned into spoons over millions of years, and then gradually erosion cut grooves into the end and turned them into short tine forks. Then, very slowly, of course, takes a long time. The forks got, you know, the grooves got deeper and longer. I knew I had the right order. You can obviously tell that, but I just felt like I had a missing link. <laughs> one day, I was flying to Connecticut on U.S. Air, and the stewardess handed me the missing link. I don't think she knew what she had, but my trained scientific eye caught it right away. Later, I went to Popeye's chicken. I now have two. <laughs> so, the evolution of silverware is nearly complete. Of course, many mutants didn't survive over the years. And once people realized I was doing studies on the evolution of the fork, they started sending me research, hoping to become famous, you know. Um, they, people, people get desperate for fame in this field. This is a cutthroat business, okay? Somebody were hoping for fame and fortune. They sent me an obvious fraud. This is a fork head on a spoon handle. <laughs> I caught it right away. I said, no, I'm sorry. This is unacceptable. This is a fraud, okay? Of course, how the race has evolved is still a question we're studying. But uh, look, arranging things in order doesn't prove a thing. You can arrange words in order, turn a cat to a cot to a dot to a dog, change in one letter at a time. It doesn't prove a cat and a dog are related. You can play around long enough, turn yourself into a fool with this, okay? Uh, they say birds, dinosaurs turn to birds. Well, let's study the evidence. The Bible says God made the birds on the fifth day, and he made the reptiles on the sixth day, which is exactly backwards to what evolution says. God has birds first, then reptiles. Let's study the evidence. This guy says, dinosaurs alive as birds. Well, you're welcome to believe that, but that's absurd, okay? There's no evidence for that whatsoever. It's one of the lies I cover on video number four of my lies in the textbook. Archaeoraptor. October 15, 1999, scientists unveil missing link of birds, dinosaurs. National Geographic, breaking news, missing link. Here's the picture he showed, October or November 99. He forgot to mention that two months later, it was admitted by everybody that it was a fraud. Archaeoraptor was disproven. It's not a missing link. Uh, the missing link is a fake, USA Today. Uh, from the remote uh, province in China, an unusual dinosaur fossil made a mysterious journal to the hands, journey to, to the, from the hands of Chinese smugglers to the National Geographic Society. It's modern paleontology's greatest embarrassment. They found out it sprouted its remarkable tail not 120 million years ago, but only shortly after being smuggled out of China. <laughs> it's the tail of a tail that has children believing in feathered dinosaurs that never existed. This one was added by an entrepreneurial Chinese farmer. It appears to have fooled another group of scientists as well as editors of the British journal Nature. Uh, Soares Olson, curator of birds at Smithsonian Institute, uh, turned the spotlight on the whole mess. 
Those involved with the scientific uh, gaffe agreed that Olson tried to warn officials at National Geographic in a letter sent November 1st, but they wouldn't listen. Both of the faked fossils were intended to support the theory that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Uh, museums including Natural History in New York also promote exhibits of dinosaur origin of birds. Um, they say birds, Olson, he still believes in evolution, but he doesn't buy into the fossils that they're being shown. He said these have been discredited. He says it happened independently. He doesn't know how it happened, but he still believes it happened, okay? Uh, there's a good article from ICR, my friends down in Southern California, Institute for Creation Research, has an article just recently, uh, March of 2000, about uh, Archaeoraptor, if you want to get more on that. Uh, here's Scientific American, March of 2003, still promoting the idea that there were feathered di dinosaur feathers. Richard Plum and Alan Brush wrote this article, which came first. All they have are illustrations designed to visually influence the reader. What we saw tonight was illustrations designed to visually influence you. This is not science, this is imagination, okay? So determined were Plum and Brush that they imagined they had put an end to the continuing debate among evolutionists regarding the origin of birds. We could read the whole article here, I don't have only got 10 minutes. Um, it was nothing more than speculation devoid of any scientific evidence, and, but they're defended with furious blind fanaticism over the last few decades. Okay. Uh, here's the uh, things you need to consider. They call this evo-devo, evolutionary development. It assumes that the developmentary pathways of living things can shed light on their alleged evolutionary histories. Both these foundations are invalid. Um, Alan Fiducia, North Carolina University Department of Biology, uh, one of the world's most prominent authorities on the subject of the origin of birds, and he believes in evolution. Fiducia actually supports the theory of evolution and believes birds emerged through evolution. However, what distinguishes him from the dino bird supporters, such as Prum and Brush, is that he admits the uncertainty in which, in which the theory of evolution finds itself on the matter. Um, in considerable detail, Dr. Fiducia describes how the theory that birds evolved from dinosaurs, first proposed by Orstrom in the 70s, and fiercely defended ever since, lacks any scientific proof, and how such an evolution is actually impossible. He said there's a considerable body of evidence that these fossil traces known as dino fuzz have nothing to do with bird feathers. What it is, apparently, is filaments of the fibers of the skin fraying and sticking out. Not bird feathers, not dino fuzz, okay? Having studied, Fiducia says, having studied most of the specimens said to sport proto feathers, I and many others do not find any credible evidence that those structures represent proto feathers. Many Chinese fossils have a strange halo of what has become known as dino fuzz, but although that material has been homologized, uh, homologized with avian feathers, the arguments are far less than convincing. Following his analysis, Fiducia said, the dino fuzz appears in fossils that can absolutely have nothing to do with birds. This dino fuzz is skin fibers, very closely resembling dino fuzz. They've been discovered in Jurassic uh, ichthyosaur. They've been described in detail in quite a few magazines here. This dino fuzz phenomena, this little fringe around some of these fossils, is found on all sorts of things. All sorts of fossils have these. Um, Fiducia recalls that similar structures have been found in the area of fossils in the past, in the area of fossils, okay, but that the structures believed to belong to the fossils were later identified as inorganic matter. One is reminded of the famous fern-like markings on the, what's the name of that, Sol Sol Solnhofen fossils, known as dendrites. Despite their plant-like outlines, these features are now known to be inorganic structures caused by a solution of manganese, from which the beds precipitated as oxides along cracks or bones in their fossils. I have a huge collection of these in my museum. It looks just like ferns. People, somebody sent me a bunch of them. And all it is, it's, it's, it's between the layers of the rock, it's this stuff soaking in, making a pattern of as it, capillary action draws it in between the cracks of the rock. That's what's happening that they're calling dino feathers. This has been proven wrong about three years ago. It's not correct, okay? Um, uh, let's see. Well, we could, I've got plenty of material on this on my website. The theropods that he mentioned here. One must also explain why all theropods and other dinosaurs discovered in other deposits where integument is preserved exhibit no dino fuzz. Why do the theropods from China have this dino fuzz, but other theropods found all around the world don't have it? They have intact skin. So the dino fuzz from the China ones is not dino fuzz. It's not proto feathers. It's just simply a phenomena of how they fossilize. Okay, uh, this was proven wrong. In, this was proven in 1999. Okay, Fiducia explains some of the creatures forward, put forward as feathered dinosaurs are extinct reptiles with dino fuzz, and others are real birds. There are clearly two different uh, phenomena in the early Cretaceous deposits. We can talk all day on this one, but uh, uh, two minutes. Okay. 
So when they tell you birds descended from dinosaurs, I, I would say the evidence is mostly disproven. What is disproven is certainly open to other interpretations. So kids, before you buy into this idea that dinosaurs turned to birds, I think you ought to really consider this from all perspectives uh, and don't get swallowed up by this stuff. Scientists are always telling me, I, they'll say, well, the latest research says, I say, wait, 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 I don't want to hear about your latest research. Your theory's been around for 120 years. What evidence do you have that has stood the test of time? They're always relying on the latest research. Well, it hasn't stood the test of time yet because it's always proven wrong later, okay? It's not dino fuzz. Somewhere along the line, that bird's going to have half wing, half feather. Now, he can't walk and he can't fly yet. What good is it, okay? Archaeopteryx is not a missing link. I'll stand by my guns. They're still teaching Archaeopteryx. It's a bird. And he mentioned tonight that it's a, Archaeopteryx is a, an avian dinosaur. Well, the experts that studied Archaeopteryx will tell you they disagree, okay? Archaeopteryx is a bird. It's 100% bird. Now, it does have a shallow breastbone. So does the Hawatson. Archaeopteryx has claws on its wings. Twelve birds today have claws on their wings, okay? Um, it's not proof of anything. The Hawatson has them, the Ibis has them, the Swan has them. Uh, Twelve birds have claws on their wings. So what? It's not proof it's a missing link. They say Archaeopteryx had teeth in his beak. Well, very few birds have teeth. There's a hummingbird that has teeth from uh, down near uh, Ecuador. But very few birds have teeth. What does that prove? Some reptiles have teeth, some don't. Some mammals have teeth, some don't. Some of you have teeth, some don't, okay? <laughs> Doesn't prove a thing, okay? Uh, only six Archaeopteryx have been found. Only one has ever been sectioned or analyzed. And I think the experts will tell you it's not an avian dinosaur. It's a bird. God designed the birds. God designed the reptiles. God designed the mammals. And God did a wonderful job. Quit time to mix them up. Thank you. Okay, it's not 400 billion. Million, you said million. Well, we believe, mainline evolutionists believe that the Earth is about 4.6 billion, year, billion years old. But if you're interested in how the, the uh, epistemology or how we think we know what we know on that, uh, it's primarily through radioactive dating. And uh, how long am I supposed to take on each reply? Just, well, just quick, but okay. Um, let me just cut to the chase here about radioactive dating. Radioactive dating is a technique which is fraught with peril. It's difficult to do. It's full of many assumptions. Uh, there have been a huge number of mistakes made with it. I still believe that it is, when properly used, an essentially trustworthy technique. And uh, here, here's the... Here's the key thing about radioactive dating in creation evolution debates. When you're, when you're trying to determine if a measuring instrument is valid, like let's say a ruler, okay, we've all measured the lengths of things with rulers. Okay, now ha has anybody here like me, I'm embarrassed to admit this, once I measured something with a ruler, and here I have a PhD in science, and I was measuring something with a ruler, and to my horror, I discovered that I was mismeasuring it. I didn't have it on the zero mark, and I actually made a mistake, okay? Here's someone with a PhD misuses a ruler. And I'm sure that many people here, children, drunkards, uh, many, many people throughout history have failed to use a ruler properly. So the key point here about radioactive dating is that if you're trying to determine whether a measuring instrument is valid or not, you cannot just look at the mistakes that have been made. This is what creationists always do. They, they, they point out dozens of mistakes that have been made with ludicrous results. But what you need to do is you need to show cases where the, the instrument was used properly. And I have, I don't have time, I have right there uh, an awesome example of radioacti radioactive dating being used properly that I think uh, it, in a single stroke can verify the uh, efficacy of it. Okay, you're talking about what would be called prebiotic evolution. How did the first cells get here? Prebiotic evolution is by far the most poorly understood thing in all of evolutionary theory. 
It's so poorly understood, in fact, that I actually tell my students that you, it would be intellect, you, you could have intellectual integrity to simply say that, it was, that the first cells were specially created by God. And I actively entertain that as a possibility. And I'm not just saying that. I really, truly entertain that as a possibility. I still think you give us about, give us about 25 years, and I think we'll solve that problem. Uh, the, the one thing that I can say empirically about it is that, OK, you have to have DNA to make proteins, but the proteins are necessary. DNA polymerase is necessary to make DNA. So you need something that can, that can both carry genetic information and act as an enzyme. And we have discovered such a thing. It's RNA, ribonucleic acid. RNA has been shown over and over in about four or five major cases to be able to function as an enzyme. For example, in the ribosome, the huge assembly that synthesizes proteins, it's been proven that the active site in that assembly, the part where amino acids are actually being placed into proteins, the active site is RNA. The closest protein is 18 angstroms away, which is light years away in biochemistry. So it by no means comes close to solving the entire problem, but RNA uh, is a huge step, a huge step toward solving this chicken and egg problem because RNA can do both. Yeah, I would say they're very far from a solution in spite of enormous federal tax dollars spent to try to solve this problem because it's unsolvable. The fact of the matter is they're just so complex. I think you could point out that most of the books in the library around here uh, are based on the same 26 letters of the alphabet. So if I go through a book by Shakespeare and a book by uh, somebody else and find out, you know, Shakespeare uses the letter E, you know, 18% of the time, and some other author uses the letter E 18% of the time. Does that prove a similarity? Well, yeah, that proves that's how often you use the letter E. Does that prove the books are related? No. I think all of the research being done on proteins of different creatures showing the similarities is evidence for common designer. And I resent that the textbooks in your town, in most towns, only present the kids with one view. They show the kids the evidence, the similarities of DNA, and say, see, this is proof of a common ancestor. No. That's too complex. It doesn't change. It's proof of a common designer, that's all. The RNA, DNA, chicken and egg problem is a very serious problem. And even if they could imagine a scenario how it could happen, again, you're back to imagination, not science. One student said to me, he said, what are you going to say if scientists make life in the laboratory? I said, well, I guess that's going to prove it takes intelligence to make life, isn't it? That's what it's going to prove. The purpose of tonight's debate was to discuss, is there evidence for evolution? I'm not asking the taxpayers to pay for my theory to be taught in the schools. If I was, the burden of proof would be on me. Since he's asking the taxpayers to pay for his religion to be taught, then the burden of proof's on him. Where's the evidence? I don't think we saw any tonight. So you have nothing to be upset about, um, except that you know, I think we did, the purpose of the debate was fulfilled. We're supposed to see, is there evidence for evolution? That was the purpose of the debate. We could debate the evidence for creation, I think, but that's like saying, you know, we need to light a candle to see the sun. Uh, the evidence for creation is all around us. It is, the, the evidence for creation is, a very powerful evidence is, the absolute impossibility of the contrary. In logic, I, if, I, if I said, I believe a lake out there is only got water for the top five feet, the rest of it's air under the water. That is logically impossible. Water is heavier than air, so it falls. To, for someone to say a complex machine like a watch happened by chance, that is logically impossible. Even though I've never seen the designer of this watch, I believe he exists because of, it's impossible for there not to be a designer. When you see a house, there must be a builder. When you see a creation, there must be a creator. So the evidence for the creator is in the creation. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, people are willingly ignorant. They don't want to see the creator, and God gives them up to their own, their own crazy beliefs. It'd be tragic if God has given up on you. I hope he hasn't yet. I suggest you read Romans chapter 1 carefully, okay? I would just like to try to make what I think is a hugely important point about evidence. I see tons of evidence for creationism. I see a thousand cases right here in front of me. Birds, atoms, the strong nuclear force. It's all evidence for creation. 
but I can also explain the origins of things through a theory that I've attempted to explain tonight. So the point here that I think people tend to forget is that a given empirical fact, such as the existence of a marvelously constructed human, can be evidence for two completely opposed things at the same time. I think the effort should be put into getting lies out of the textbooks. Any textbook that teaches that the embryo has gill slits, the page ought to be torn out. Okay, it's not true. If they teach the whale has a vestigial pelvis, that page ought to be torn out. It's not true. If they teach about the so-called cavemen, whether it be Lucy or, you know, you name it, you watch my video number three, or number two, I cover all those. Or there's a book called Bones of Contention dealing with the Neanderthals or a, um, a buried alive about the Neanderthals. Bones of Contention covers all the cavemen. I just simply think textbooks should be accurate. Take the lies out. Don't tell them the embryo has gills. It's not true. They have folds of skin. I got folds of skin in my elbow and behind my knee, too. So it, it does, I can't breathe through them, okay? So I think what's happening is we have about 50 basic lies that are continually put into the textbooks because that's all they have for evidence. It's true there are lobe fin fish. It's not true that we know they evolved to something else. It's not true. You can believe that if you want, but you just left science and went into fantasy land which is fine for fantasy textbooks, but it's not fine for science books. So I think what you should do is continually go after, we need to get people with intelligence on the select textbook selection committees to select books that don't have these lies. We need to get people writing textbooks that don't have these lies. We need to get people demanding, we need to get some lawyers that love God to sue the schools for, for allowing lies into the textbooks. California law is very clear. You can't have, you have to have accurate, up-to-date textbooks. You don't have them in California. Fix it. That would take an hour to answer that question. Yes, uh, there was, but I go with great detail on video number six of my series. You can watch it right on my website for free. Uh, uh, the, uh, there are two theories about the Ice Age among Christians. There certainly was an Ice Age. My theory that I propose on video six is believed by many millions of people. It's not original with me. Is that uh, the Ice Age actually caused the flood. The Earth got hit by an ice meteor or we went through the tail of a comet. Anyway, a bunch of ice from space got dumped on the poles which is the only way to explain the rapid freezing of so many animals, you know, it froze so quickly, had to require something colder than naturally occurs on Earth, something around 300 below zero. Doesn't ever get that cold on Earth, and yet we find mammoths frozen with food still in their stomach, still preserved. You can't freeze an animal that big in, without freezing them real fast, or else the food in the stomach's gonna rot. The outside will freeze, inside will rot, so I cover that for an hour and a half, or maybe two hours on video number six. On the, uh, you can watch on the website or get on the table out there, okay? Okay, if you want one that would, that's a macroevolutionary related mutation that might have actually done some good, let me, let me show you that. Here's the biggie. If we evolve from ape-like creatures, it's believed that about two million years ago, a creature that was already walking on two legs, that was already bipedal, the brain grew explosively big, very, very fast. So we now have a brain that is three times bigger than a chimp, okay? The question is, how could that have happened through mutations to DNA, all right? So I'm talking about big time evolution here. I'm talking about as big a thing as you could discuss. How did our brains get here? All right, Boston, in a lab in Boston, there's a group of people who study brain evolution. And they ask the question, can we take a mammal, now you can't do these experiments in humans, it's illegal, you'll be thrown in jail, so we have to do them in other mammals. And the easiest ones to do them are in mammals like mice. Uh, someone can try this in a chimp if they want to, I'd have ethical problems, frankly, doing so something like this with a chimp, but anyway. The experiment was done in a mouse, which is a mammal, just like us. And they asked, is there any way that we can cause a mouse to have a bigger brain in a single step, okay? And what they did, for anyone here who's a biology teacher, I'll be technical for a minute, what they did is they took the beta-catenin gene, which codes for a protein, that is known to help cells keep re-entering into the cell division cycle, causing things to get bigger. And they uh, 
They're, they had reasons to believe that if they could upregulate the beta cat gene in the central nervous system, that it might make a bigger brain. So they cloned, they cloned the beta cat gene, they inactivated the amino terminus of it so that it would not be degraded, would stick around longer in the cells. They cloned in front of it an enhancer from the intron 2 of another gene that they knew was expressed in the central nervous system. They put it into a mouse embryo, they grew up the mouse, okay? And here's the results. The next slide. Okay, that's phase space diagram for how they evolved. And the next one. There's the cover picture from Science. This was published in 2002, it made the cover of Science. Next slide. Here's the tech, uh, okay, they're trying to make nerve cells, uh, central nervous system cells keep dividing. The next one, there's the, tech, the technique that they used, putting this enhancer in front of it to upregulate the beta cat gene. And here's the slide that you really need to see. Here is, the, here is a normal mouse brain, and here's the upregulated beta cat mutant. Okay, this brain, was almost twice the mass of a normal mouse brain. Almost twice. And notice something else. Notice that there are no convolutions in a mouse's brain like ours, the this, this sulci and so forth. Notice that this brain spontaneously formed convolutions very similar to a human brain. And that's in a single step mutation. And the fact that they can do something in the laboratory certainly is not proof that it did happen in nature. So again, you're back to a religious belief, not a scientific statement, okay? And the convolutions, I think, would be normal. You see, humans have a section of the brain called Broca's convolution that allows speech. No other animal has that. There are giant steps in, in our brain. Even arranging them in order wouldn't prove it happened. You could take an animal with a small brain and an animal with a big brain, that proves no relationship. If I get buried on top of a hamster, that does not prove he's my grandpa, okay? So what they're doing is they're doing stuff on paper and imagining how it might have happened. This is not real science. This is imagination, this is fairy tale stuff. So you can, you can play with the genes and cause the mouth. They do the same thing with, polyploidal, with uh, polyploidy with vegetables and stuff. You can take strawberries and manipulate the genes and they double the chromosome number and you get giant strawberries that taste terrible, okay? But they're twice the size. That's not new information. It's a doubling of existing information. No different than a cow having five legs or something, you know. It's not new information. It's a doubling or expanding of existing information. There are no examples, no examples, where a naturally occurring mutation has, called an increase, has caused an increase in genetic complexity. Richard Dawkins, who refused to debate me from Cambridge University when I was over there a few months ago, Richard Dawkins was asked on TV, he said, can you think of one example of a mutation that has caused an increase in genetic complexity. Evolution would require billions of them. Can you name one, please? He was dead silent for 19 seconds. Finally, he said, shut off the camera, please. There aren't any. There are none. So, had to be designed, my, my case, okay? Okay, I don't think I am the issue at all. I think the truth is the issue, and God's word is the issue, which is at, at basically at stake. I had probably 15 of, uh, uh, Dr. Rainbow's students come to tell me that he spends his entire class pushing the evolution theory and really gives creationists or Christians a hard time. So uh, he's using tax dollars to do that. So I guess I feel like I'm defending truth. It's not, I'm not defending me. Uh, if, if I came across as prideful, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm just a lowly high school science teacher that's sick and tired of his tax dollars being used to destroy the faith of kids. That's all. Ernest Haeckel falsified and was proven to have falsified uh, certain drawings of embryos, and the fact that, okay, l let me show a slide. At the top, that's what the phylotypic stage of vertebrate embryos actually look like, and Dr. Hoven f showed an excellent slide of it with actual photographs. They are different at the top there, but notice also how similar they are. And the next slide, that is a human embryo. And here you see the long, uh, here's the 
leg, hind leg developing what us evolutionists would call a very long fish-like tail, just like the fish embryo has. And then here we see the subject of our discussion tonight. These are called pharyngeal gill clefts. And these form in a fish, just like this, and they also form in a human. So the take home message from the, the theory of evolution is that evolutionary theory predicts very powerfully that organisms would have to, to some degree, recapitulate in their embryology what happened in evolution. And I have, a, I have a 45 minute lecture that I actually gave this very day in my class on vertebrate evo devo, in which I show how this is very strong. No, they're not gill slits. These are not gill slits, and Dr. Hovind is totally correct in trying to rip that stupid statement out of the textbooks. It's totally deceiving to say that a human embryo has gill slits. We don't. We, we have the remains of one, which is your eustachian tube. It still goes from the outside to the inside of your throat. We have the remains of one, but we do have pharyngeal gill clefts just like a fish does. And it's, it would take me a long time to, to demonstrate it, but it's evidence, for, it's evidence for evolution. It's exactly the kind of thing we would expect to see if the theory is true, and we see it. I think if from a design perspective, as the baby develops inside the mother, it's very important that the nervous system develop first and the circulatory system develop first. The, the hind legs are unnecessary for the first few months of development. He's not going to go anywhere. Okay? So if you'll notice where the hind legs are going to be growing, this is not a tail. These, these uh, five or sometimes six little bones become the tail bone, the coccyx. The next five or six up become the lumbar. Some people have five, some have six. Most have five fused together for the lumbar. And that's exactly the right position where they are. So what you see happening here is the backbone and the central nervous system is developing first, which is the logical way it has to develop. The, it starts with the brain. It has to end someplace. It ends at the end of the tail. My wife bruised her tailbone four years ago and is still in pain today, every day. We've tried everything to get that fixed. So the tailbone is essential. The nervous system has to end someplace. And it starts out, this is a developmental sequence, okay? Back up one slide if you could there for me. Notice this is a drawing. This is not a picture. This is a drawing, okay? These drawings are fake. If you turn my projectors on here, I again stand by the actual photographs. These are the drawings Haeckel made. These are the photographs. He's still trying to teach this is evidence. It's not, okay? It's just simply not true. Take it out of the book, okay? Thank you. Do I see myself as a sinner before holy God? And what do I think will happen if I die? On those days when I believe in God, which is about half the time, I have no fear whatsoever uh, of facing him because I believe that I do a reasonably good job of trying, uh, my, here's my philosophy of, of life, my kids. I believe that the only thing that you need to do in life, and if there is a God, the only thing that he cares about us doing ultimately, ultimately, is to enjoy nature and love people. I tell my kids, enjoy nature and love people. And that's all that you ever have to do, and I am willing to face any almighty that might exist. And secondly, if God doesn't exist, which I believe about half the time, when I die, I will turn into peat moss. And I will be dead, not just a long time, but forever. My, to my response to that question would be, yes, I certainly do think I'm a wicked sinner before a holy, righteous God, but I've been forgiven based on the blood of Jesus Christ, not based on my good works. If you'd uncover the projector just for a minute, here's what uh, Thomas Huxley said. I'm sorry, Julian Huxley. That one's out of focus. You've been, can you, that one there? Uh, he said, Julian Huxley is the grandson of Thomas Huxley, who really promoted Darwin. Huxley said, I suppose the reason we leapt at the origin of species was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. Well, there's an honest comment, okay? Uh, Michael Ruse, former Christian, said evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is an ideology, a secular religion. 
a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. He said, I'm ardent, he said, I'm an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian. But I must admit that in this one complaint, and Mr. Gish is but one of many to make it, the ev literalists are absolutely right. Evolution's a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning and it's true of evolution still today. So it's something people believe in. It's not something they have real scientific evidence for. I think that uh, as far as what happens when we die, we're going to stand before a holy, righteous God and give an account for everything we've said, done, or thought about. And if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, I would fear that day. Okay? Okay, we're talking about the Big Bang Theory. And my way of thinking about that whole thing is very simple, philosophically. If the Big Bang occurred, and I think there's tremendous evidence to support empirically that, that, it, did it, that it did take place, Scientists, us scientists, are completely, totally, 100% incapable, incapable of explaining why it happened. As is the case with a huge number of things in science that we still can't explain. A science is always trying to explain things. And so you're asking kind of a metaphysical question. And uh, where did that come yeah, from? Yeah, well. Half the time, I'd say God. And the other time, I'd say, we don't know. You know, I, I tell people, the three most important words in the English language, what are the three most important words to use in the English, English language? Answer, I love you, okay? Now, what are the second most important three words to use in the English language? I don't know. That's my philosophy of life. And metaphysically, the Big Bang physicists and the theologians are in metaphysically exactly the same boat because they both have to explain either how something was always here, either a universe or a god, or they have to explain how something came into being ex nihilo, out of nothing. Both philosophies share exactly the same problem. I can show you what the textbooks teach. This is uh, Discover magazine last year. Where did everything come from? He says here, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada. As it became bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory explains everything. Well, Alan Guth said in Scientific American, he said, the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. That's a dot. He said, it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. That's what they teach. Now, th I tell them, you're welcome to believe that. I don't care what you believe, but that's not science, and it shouldn't be taught in the textbooks at taxpayer expense. Okay? Um, I would agree with that. Yeah, that's got nothing to do with science, and that goes to metaphysical. But several questions weren't answered earlier. Uh, uh, and I do uh, appreciate Dr. Rainbow coming tonight. I've been turned down over 3,000 times for debates. Professors simply won't debate it. They want to stand in front of their class where they have an obvious academic and psychological advantage over their students. But it's very rare to find one willing to defend his position in front of somebody over which he, has, he has, doesn't have his thumb on. He has no control over me whatsoever. He's not going to give me a grade. I'm not the least bit afraid of him. And students in his class are going to face this for the rest of the semester, though. I mean, tomorrow morning, he's going to get to teach his view for an hour to a group of kids, and then the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And I think it's only fair that students get to see both sides. And I'll be willing to come speak at your college class any time. If I'm out in the area, give me a call. or come uh, share the creation view. Thank you so much. It's a great question, and here's the answer. If you, I want you to all think about what you would have to do to see macroevolution taking place today. Us evolutionists are completely confident. We're 100% sure, as sure as he is that Christ died for his sins. We're sure that evolution is taking place constantly all over the earth. Why don't we see it? Think about this. If you wanted to observe macroevolution, if you wanted to see a pretty big change taking place from one species to another, where on earth would you go to have the highest probability of seeing it? And the answer is a rainforest. You saw the picture of the Costa Rican rainforest with me in there? 
You'd want to go to a rainforest, and the reason why is because rain, tropical rainforests contain arthropods, insects. Okay, there's millions of them. There may be, it's not impossible, there may be 30 million species of insects on this planet. Most of them haven't, haven't been discovered yet, okay? And we know that insects are a veritable playground for evolution. They seem to evolve very rapidly, okay? So if ever you had a chance to see macroevolution, it would be in a rainforest. You got all these insects, insects evolve rapidly, that's the place to go. You with me? Okay, now, so there I was in a Costa Rican rainforest and looking for macroevolution, quote unquote, and I, sure enough, I didn't find it. Why? Well, you remember the pictures of the butterflies? There you saw some pictures of butterflies. If I, dis if I go down there and I discover a brand new butterfly, totally radically new butterfly that no one's ever seen before, okay? What do I do? What do I do epistemologically? Is that, is that a brand new butterfly that just evolved yesterday? It may be. I'm totally confident that new butterflies are evolving all the time down there. How do I know? There's, there may be a million species of butterflies on this planet that just haven't been discovered. And then the second thing is to document that it was evolution, what else do you have, what do you really have to see? Think of my central mechanism of evolution thing. Mutation in the germline cells of a parent, right, leads to altered embryological development, which shows up in the offspring, right? So what would you have to do to verify that it's a, a newly evolved butterfly? You have to have faith. No. The parent and the offspring. No, that's not the right answer. What would you have to do? It's an empirical scientific question. You'd have to find the parents. You have to find the parents and show that the parents look different from the offspring. Well, what are your chances of finding the parents of a butterfly in a Costa Rican rainforest? See, so we're in a situation similar to, uh, you know, 100 years ago, you look at the moon, okay? The moon looks spherical. The moon probably has a backside. You could come up to somebody and say, do you think the moon has a backside? Well, yeah, I think so. We'll prove it. See, you know darn well it has a backside, but you're totally incapable of proving it. We know darn well that macroevolution is taking place on other grounds that I don't have time to talk about, but we are in fact completely incapable of proving it for the reasons that I've just given you, okay? Okay, and I think that demonstrates clearly what I've been saying all night. It's a religion, it's not a faith. I mean, it's not a science, okay? It's easy to, to, to think the moon has a backside because of the impossibility of the contrary, okay? All round, objects, all round objects that we see have backsides to them. Now, the idea that there's not a creator is clearly impossible. Things are just too complex. There had to have been a creator. As far as the, what the original question of going from, you know, dinosaurs to birds, if you could undo the covers there, please. There are thousands and thousands, possibly millions of differences between reptiles and birds and is glossing over these gross differences. The lung structure, you mentioned about the bone structure. Bones are hollow on birds and solid on reptiles. The lung structure is different. The eggs are different. The reproductive system is different. There are thousands of major differences and probably millions or billions of minor differences. Reptiles are covered with scales. Birds are covered with feathers. They're both made of keratin, but that's where the similarity stops. They come from different genes on the chromosome. Uh, feathers are extremely complex. Your hair is made of keratin. Your fingernails are made of keratin. The fact that different structures in the world are made of keratin on different creatures is proof the designer is using the same material for different applications. Just like battleships and forks and tin cans are all made out of iron, that doesn't prove a relationship. It proves iron's a good metal to make a lot of different things out of, and keratin's a good protein to make a lot of things out of. It's not at all evidence of relationship. It's evidence of design. The second law of thermodynamics is antithetical to evolution because order cannot arise out of disorder. Is that how you've heard it formulated? Yeah. Okay. Is Terry here tonight? My colleague Terry made three video clips for me. W would you agree with that statement that order cannot arise from disorder? Because that's how I very often hear it stated. 
Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, well, can I, okay, look at, the, watch this. Now, you're sure, order cannot arise from disorder. Oh, good heavens. Okay, watch this. What just happened? A few milligrams of highly disordered, what we would call high entropy state water molecules, vibrating, rotating, translating through space, went from a highly disordered state, a high entropy state, to a much more ordered state. Here's another one. Here are, here in a culture dish are bacteria growing. Untold trillions of highly disordered glucose molecules and lipids and so forth in a chaotic state are turning into a highly ordered state. And the last one, and I don't mind doing this because I know that Dr. Hoven will love to respond to these pictures. Okay. Here, finally, is a narcissus plant. What's happening there? Again, highly disordered carbon dioxide molecules in the air, water molecules in the soil are becoming ordered. So before your very eyes, order is being created out of disorder. High entropy materials are entering into a lower entropy state. So one thing is certain, the, the usually heard statement that order cannot arise from disorder is complete poppycock, and creationists need to stop using that. And my colleague, Kent Hoven, is way too smart to use that statement. He, will never, he would never be stupid enough to say that. See, he would never use that. I'm telling, this is a sermon for you guys. Stop using that silly statement. Now what Dr. Hoven will say next is that what you need to create order out of disorder is two things. You need Gibbs free energy. You need a high quality source of free energy to drive it. And it's not enough to just give something energy. You need an intelligent, so to speak, system, some kind of a biochemical orderly system that can harness the energy and do something with it, okay? You shine sunlight on uh, the roof of your car, it destroys the roof of your car. You shine sunlight on the Narcissus plant and it, it grows. Okay, so the question is, where does the order come from in that plant? Answer, DNA. Where did DNA come from? <coughs> evolution. Where did, where, did, where did evolution come from, in my opinion? God. God designed this self-assembling system. So behold the glory of God in that Narcissus plant. Okay, okay uh, what he gave are clear examples that the second law of thermodynamics does indeed hold because that Narcissus plant did not grow without the DNA telling it what to do. It took an enormous amount of energy, not only from the sun, but also from the water and from the uh, soil. So everything does tend toward disorder is the most commonly way of stating the second law of thermodynamics. All the examples he gave, like the snowflake coming from disordered water, is an example, is, is the opposite of an example of what he wants to use. Because what happened there, the snowflake was forming because of the design of the water molecule. Water molecules are designed with a 105 degree angle between the hydrogens uh, as it attaches to the oxygen molecule. It vibrates around some, but as, you, as it loses energy, it starts to lock into a system because of the design of the molecule. Anybody that studied mineralogy will tell you minerals cleave based upon the design of the atom, okay? Sodium, for instance, cleaves into perfect cubes. Sodium chloride does, salt, because of the design of how the sodium and chlorine go together. And uh, molecules cleave with all sorts of different cleavage because of the types of design in the molecule. 
So this is another, he, it was a classic example for what you're saying, uh, that the creationists are right. Things don't tend toward order. Adding energy certainly doesn't bring order. And to say that the, uh, the plant can go from disorder to order, and that's an example of a violation of the second law of thermodynamics, is ludicrous. When he was asking the question, order cannot arise from disorder, do you agree with that statement? I was shaking my head, because I knew that's a trick question. He's probably used this on thousands of students through his class. And it's a trick question, and the student goes away baffled, like, wow, I guess I was wrong. The, the question is, can order arise from disorder without an intelligence behind it? He demonstrated it requires an intelligence behind it, but he's not going to tell that to the students. It required an intelligence. It required a design in the molecule of the water or a design in the DNA. Okay, but it's deceitful to say that the second law of thermodynamics, that evolution violates, it doesn't violate it. Evolution does violate it because they want to get all this stuff to evolve without the designer. That's what it boils down to. Now, adding energy uh, does not help, okay? Uh, the universe is a closed system by definition, and adding energy is purely destructive unless there's a mechanism to use the energy. I point out the Japanese added energy to Pearl Harbor. They didn't organize a thing. We added energy to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Didn't organize anything over there either. So the second law of thermodynamics, do, evolution does violate the known second law of thermodynamics. And I think it's deceitful to say that it doesn't with the examples that he gave because that's a clear example for creation, not for evolution. Tell us, please, what is your recommend? What? Okay, I teach general biology at Antelope Valley College, all right? It's a public school. Right supported by taxpayer funds. Correct. And I'm asking, this is not a rhetorical question now. I'm truly asking you because I'm interested in your answer. What do you think I should do, given the fact that I can't stand up and sing the doxology, okay, even though a lot of my students are Christians, right? What do you think I should teach scientifically about how living things got here? Okay. You mentioned fossils are rare. That is not correct. Fossils are abundant. There are trillions of fossils. Transitional fossils are rare. I think they're totally non-existent. There are many major evolutionists like Stephen Gould and Niles Eldridge who would disagree with you. They would say there are no transitional forms. That proves evolution happened quickly. So the problem is not that fossils are rare. The problem is that fossils that support your theory are rare. Okay. Then you also mentioned give us time. Okay. Un it's been 140 years. It, what you're saying is we don't have the evidence yet. I think most people would agree with that. There isn't the evidence. There are giant gaps in the records. So until you get the proof, stop teaching it like science. It's not science. Now, you should tell. No, I'm answering your question. OK, you're telling me what I shouldn't teach, what, you should what I should teach. You should teach the kids. We observe animals producing the same kind of animals. We don't know how they got to this planet. But I'm telling you, the textbooks at Antelope Valley College do not teach evolution as a theory. They teach evolution as a fact. They do, that's true. And it shouldn't be done that way. Stop doing that. So teach kids, dogs produce dogs. Teach the kids, if you teach biology, teach all the muscles, the bones, the nerves that were, were amazingly designed. Stop telling them this is adapted to their environment. Start telling them it's probably designed for their environment. If the kid says, who's the designer? Say, I don't know. We're not here to talk about that. I don't know if it's Allah or Buddha or Jehovah or a mysterious process we don't know yet. All I know is it looks like it's designed. So are you saying that I, that I can't try to say anything at all about the origin of living things? I mean, sci one of science's greatest quests, whether it be astronomy, where did stars and galaxies come from, uh, geology, one of science's greatest quests is to the origins of things. That's a fascinating question. Right. This stuff's here? How did it get here? You'd have to be, you'd have to have concrete in your brain to not wonder that. Okay, and that's, so, sci one of the, the greatest goals of science is to explain the origins of things. So what do I say positively about origins? I would say that would raise several major questions. I don't think science can handle the subject of origins. It's not part of science. We observe dogs producing dogs. How the original dog get here is outside the realm of science. Don't discuss it. No matter what you say about origins, either side is going to upset somebody. 
If you talk the creation view, you're going to upset the evolutionists. If you talk the evolution view, you're going to upset the creationists. The subject cannot be discussed in a taxpayer-funded school without alienating somebody. It's unnecessary to biology. You could teach all about the anatomy of frogs and hamsters and, and humans and whales without ever getting into origins. Why waste time on it? There's so much to learn. To, if we want students to be good doctors someday, they need to learn the biology. The origins has nothing to do with it. There isn't a doctor on this planet that does surgery on people that his, sub, his study of origins has anything to do with this surgery on these people. It has nothing to do with it. Okay? So... It raises, it raises a much bigger question of should we even have public schools because there are getting into the origin subject. Maybe everybody should just go to privately funded schools. The Muslims can teach what they believe. The Catholics can teach what they believe. The Baptists teach what they believe. And then strict competition. The better doctors would win out the jobs. It wouldn't matter. I'm telling you, the subject of evolution is unnecessary. It's counterproductive. It's a waste of time. And it's, it's, not, it's not science. It's, why is it included? I think you should simply, as kids, I'm going to teach you biology. You probably know an enormous amount of biology about the nervous system, about the circulatory system, the lymphatic system, the, all the systems of the body. Teach it. Leave the origins out of it. Contrary to what some of my students say, about 85% of what I teach in my general biology course is not evolution. Good. I get accused all the time, oh, Dr. Rainbow, that's all he ever teaches is evolution. That is complete poppy cup. You look, you look at my syllabus, I'm teaching them about DNA and RNA and proteins, and uh, that's good. so I do. You, you asked what I thought you should do. I would leave out the other 15% then and make 100% biology, just teach biology.